Monty, his part in my victory. Written and read by Spike Milligan. Our first victory, May the 7th, 1943. In a tent dripping with rain, Battery Clerk Lance Bombardier Mick, I think I'm ruptured, Hamer, rattled a dodgy typewriter and printed, To Berber reported clear of enemy, leading elements of armoured div entering Tunis, etc., etc. We got to engage pockets of diards holding out on Jebel El Arusia, said a man claiming to be a sergeant. Oh, uh, what's a diehards? asked Gunner Birch. Well, uh, when you die, you go hard, said White, like gangsters in cement. Ha! <sighs> Is that what they call hardened criminals, said Birch. You're a cunt, said Devine. Tunis has fallen, up, said Daisy. Had we, ordinary layabouts, beaten the formidable German army? Dear Führer, beaten we have been by the ordinary layabouts, signed formidable German army. We won, said White, as though it had been a game of football. Gunner Lee parts his hair, the comb clogged with a six-month patty of brill cream and dust. I bet the victory cost Ladbrokes a fortune. We was under the one. Oh, I hear that there's fighting in Cap Bon. You must have good hearing. That's twenty miles away. We gathered round the cookhouse in a gully adjacent to the now silent guns. Looming behind us is Longstop Hill, a blood-drenched salient taken at bayonet point by the Argyles. In the twilight, our ground sheets glisten with rain. Uh, what's for the victory feasts? said a cheery voice. Something that went splash was dropped into his mess tin. May the 8th, 1943. Deluge. The rain not only mainly fell on the plain in Spain, it also fell mainly on the back of the bloody neck, dripping down the spine into the socks where it came out of the lace holes in the boots. Christ, we've got to move again. Who runs this bloody battery? Carter Patterson. In darkness, we loaded vehicles. I crashed into someone. Who's that? I don't know. I think I start with G. Who are you? If this thing on my back isn't a kit bag, I'm Quasimodo. I backed a truck down a slope. A scream. Ow! Oh, fuck! Who's that? It's me foot! I never knew it swore. A fist hits me in the ear roll. Oh. The move is held up by torrential rain. Meanwhile, Sergeant Dawson has got bloody malaria and is taken sweating, farting and shaking to a hospital. That's what comes of flogging his mebrigan tablets to the wogs as sweets. Rain, mud, boredom. Christ, said Gunner White, I must be bored. I just thought of Catford. Occasionally, a lorry door would open as an occupant pissed out of the sides to cries of, You're spoiling the carpet! A creature shining like glycerine approached, his boots great dustbin lids of mud. Let me in, it groaned. I can't swim. Ah, Edgerton squeezed in. Anything on the wireless, he said. No, the batteries are flat. <laughs> I thought they were square, he said. I'll turn on the windscreen wipers. It's not much, but it's the best I can do. He watched the blade sweep the rain from the glass. Oh, he groaned in ecstasy. What other army can give you perversions like this? The rain is now frightening. The ground is rapidly flooding. We better start building a fucking ark, said Sergeant Ryan. Lunch came. Lunch went. Tea came, tea went. Dinner came, dinner went. That was May the 8th, 1943. Anyone want to buy it? It's going cheap. Nazi news flash. The scene, Mrs. Eichmann's boarding house, Bolivia. Himmler. Ach, ein bugger. We should never have lost Tunis if the Fuhrer had only eaten his tin of P.A.D. Goring. P.A.D.? Himmler. Yeah. P.A.D. Prolonged Active Dog. If mein Führer had eaten Prolonged Active Dog today, he would be 159 with a beautiful coat. May the 9th, 1943. Dawn. Rain stopped. I prod Edgington. Awake, the morning in a bowl of light, thus cast the stone that puts the stars to flight. Bollocks, he replied. No, no, it was Fitzgerald. All right. Fitzgerald's bollocks, then. The sun rose, angering the morning sky, and Edgerton was none too pleased either. What's the time, he said, as he unstuck his tongue from the roof of his mouth with a spoon. It's ours, oh, 0600, darling. It's ours too bloody early, darling, he replied. He opened his eyes with a sound like the tearing apart of flypapers. 
Driver files wrapped on the window. I'm driving to Tunis. Edgington sits up. Can I come too? <laughs> it's about time you came too, I chuckled. The boot missed me, landed in the mud, and sank slowly out of sight. It's one-legged marching from now on, I tell him. We set off across the Gubalat plain to Tunis, following the wake of the victorious 6th and 7th armoured div. We passed smouldering tanks, dead soldiers, and grotesque valley positions. Arab families emerging from hiding, baffled and frightened, and the children, always the children, more baffled and frightened than the rest. In the Tunis streets, the milling throng are thronging the mills. At a cafe, two German officers drink coffee. Lieutenant Walker asked what they were doing, and in perfect broken English they replied, We are waiting to be took prisoners, old boy. We motored slowly through the crowded streets, being kissed several times by pretty girls, and once by a pretty boy. And no one's kissed me, complained Gunner Holt, his face like a dog's bum with a hat on. Never mind, here comes one now. I'll stamp on her glasses. A fat lady with revolving bosom shouts, Vive les Americans! She thinks we're Americans, said Holt. Well, slip one upper, then blame them, says Divine. A group of Aitais insist they be taken prisoner, or they'll surrender. Sorry, I explained. We, British Army prisoners. The day passed with the drinking of wine and the ogling of women. We were well oiled when two gunners, the Pills, twins, catch the lift. Either I'm pissed or he is, said Divine, referring to the twins. The Pills told us that the battery had rejoined regiment on to the side of Thud Mela. By sheer luck, we found it in the ark. Have you caught it yet? greeted Mohammed Yadin. He held up a half-empty bottle. I recognised the gesture at once. I must have been pretty stoned. When I awoke next morning, I was fully dressed, face downwards, on the roof of a lorry, with a severe attack of face. On your bloody feet, said a Fian sergeant. We're going into action again. He's bottled up in Cap Bon, so no Tunis Tatars today. Jeter Jack consults his map. Milligan, he says, we're going into Cap Bon to establish a suitable OP. What's wrong with Lewisham, I said. I've just written home saying, stop worrying, fighting has stopped. And now I've got to send a telegram saying, ignore last letter, said Driver Shepherd. Oh, if you want to drive him really mad, I said, send the telegram saying, ignore last telegram. Driver Shepherd has a large boil on his neck, covered with a circular plaster. While he slept, some artist had drawn a bell push with the word press on it, and they did. My diary. Motoring inland towards Jebel ben Uliad, stopped to ask Jerry prisoners the way. Cheetah Jack takes shortest route, twixt himself and whiskey flask, and flags down Mercedes carrying German officers. Point blank asks them, Haven't he schnapps? He gets three bottles. A message from RHQ. Return to base. What? said Cheetah, snatching the mic. He shouts, We've only just bloody arrived. Who's buggering us around? We've been up since 0600. Will you make up your bloody minds? What is the situation? All was wasted as he'd forgotten to press the transmit button. They're all bloody deaf back there. Drive on, Shepherd. The road is a mixture of Allied and Axis transport. Groups of German talk with British soldiers. All very strange. Have you any of that fruitcake left, Milligan? No, sir. Just asking, Milligan. It's a hot evening. I don't see why we, we shouldn't indulge in a dip. Have you got your costume? No, sir. I learnt to swim in the nude. Adjacent to a POW camp, where a brass band played terrorly and waltzes, we enjoyed a delicious swim in the med, Starkers, save Chater, who wore his knee-length drawers cellular, something to do with an officer being properly dressed. The sky turned the colour of a cutthroat that bled onto the sea. I swam out about three hundred yards. Then, to my horror, I saw a mine floating towards me. I yelled a warning, one part salt water and two parts swearing. Chater Jack shouts, Quick! Exploded with small arms. It's ruining the holiday. We blazed away, and soon a hundred of His Majesty's soldiers were showing what bloody awful shots they were. Finally, with a roar, the monster exploded. I hit it, said Major Chetidek. It was me. If anyone contradicts me, he'll be on a charge. Now, let's get back. It's time for the cooks to poison us. On the return journey, we pass a village, Cretinville. Stop, said Major Chetidek, chuckling. We entered Le Hotel Brilliant a mud hut held together by a doorknob and two oil lamps. At several tables sat several Arabs drinking coffees. On the walls were posted of a man called Bourguiba, who, after the war, became prime minister of that country. The major ordered the four Vimblancs, and we repeated the order three times, just missing me. 
Well, let's be getting along, gentlemen, said the Major. We followed him into the dark. The truck moved off, and I got the BBC News. Axis forces are bottled up in Cap Bon. If the BBC but knew, we were all bottled up. We sang, we were drunk last night, we were drunk the night before. We're going to get drunk tonight if we never get drunk any more. The more we drink, the merrier we shall be. For we are the boys of the Royal Artillery. Now everybody knew. I picked up a faint German broadcast of a very corny band playing old Jack Hilton arrangements. The singer, could I ever forget his name, Ernst Strains. His vibrato sounded like he was driving a tractor over a ploughed field with weights tied to his scrotum. We were back at midnight. The battery were all wide awake. There were fires and sing-songs. Hello, 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 said watchful Edgington, bathing in a tin of hot water. Ah, having a bath, I said. Yes, he said, I've found the book of instructions. Mail. There were letters from my parents, a dozen hot knicker girls, ah, ha, ha, and one from Louise, ah, gag, heel, heel, down, boy. My parents were well. Father was still wearing a wig. Brother Desmond was still skinny and being hit by everyone. My father was now a captain. He rejoined the army to get the uniform, as his own suit had the arse out of it. Since he was a boy, he had been obsessed with the romance of the Old West. I grew up with rooms full of guns. He believed that red Indians lurked in every corner, so all his life he carried a six-shooter. I was lucky to have lived through the peace unwounded. The letter from Louise left me gasping. I rolled on the ground to beat out the flames. Oh, what's the matter, O oh son of khaki, said Edgerton. It's the one-eyed trouser snake, I groaned. Ah, Louise! That night I went to bed, a virile twenty-five-year-old Adonis. I woke next morning, a ninety-year-old broken-down onanistic wreck. May the 11th, 1943. Get up, you dirty little devil, said a prematurely aged Edgington, breaking his blankets over his knee. May the 11th was exactly the same as the 8th, only worse. Much worse. Exactly much worse. Hitlergram number 091546. The scene, a mixed naffy in Tunis. Hitler. For why are the British Tommy Atkins always making mitts a morning? Tommy Atkins. It's this bleeding crappy war. Hitler. How dare you say that mine war is crappy? This is the best war you have had for twenty years. Soon it will be as good as World War I, and I will be in the Guinness Book of Records, you little Tommy Atkins creep. What did your life consist of before, eh? Porridge, half a pint of warm sticky beer, Anton Walbrook in dangerous moonlight, midst a bloody awful Warsaw concerto, two pounds ten shillings on one shag of eek, with that wife with a face like a chicken's bum? Tommy Atkins, you started it all. Hitler, me? You declared war on us, you cockney creep. Tommy Atkins, that's because you kicked the shit out of the poles. Hitler, everybody kicks shit out of the poles. That is what they're there for. May the 12th, 1943. Driver Files War Diary says, Lazy day at camp. The lads were preparing for visits to Tunis. We're conquerors, that's what we are said Gunner Patrick Devine in thick Liverpoolian tones. Strange conqueror he looked standing in a tin of hot water, with muscular arms, powerful shoulders, thin white legs, and knees that seemed to range up and down his shins when he coughed. Edgington is crouched over Devine's bath, waiting to boil eggs in it. Swearing, soldiers for the use of, is coming from under a bonnet. This truck is at it, said Fars. When I press the brake pedal, the lights go on, and a voice speaks to me from the steering wheel. Sherwood is ironing his KDs. He places them inside two boards and drives his bread carrier over the top. In Chater Jack's tent, the telephone rang. Hello, CO-19 battery here. Ah! He put his hand over the mouthpiece. It's all over. Von Arnhem has surrendered and he's very, very angry. Well, this could mean war, said Lieutenant Button, who was really in the middle of Beethoven's fifth. Chater Jack called a general parade. It's officially over, he said with a huge satisfied grin. God, thank God, at last we're safe, said Gunner Forrest, for the first time in months removed his tin hat. Gunner Woods is puzzled. I don't understand. We're fighting Germany, yet we're here in Africa bloody miles from Germany. Well, that's because the weather's better here, said Files. If you get killed when you're suntanned, you don't look too bad. Mind you, he said, up north, on the Russians' front, the cold preserves the body so good, they post them back to the relatives. May 13th, 1943. 
Bright, sunny day, warm breeze. Some gunners go with Jeter Jack to see the results of our counter-battery work. Conducted tour of shell holes? Not for me. We bagged a scout car. Files, White, Devine and me, not Edgington. He was kneeling in his tent, pointing at it and saying, Down, boy. We stopped outside Tunis to dust ourselves, then plunged into the streets. At an outdoor cafe, a night-eye POW trio play Neapolitan songs, then go round with a hat. It's your own bloody fault for losing the war, shouts White. On this day, I meet a girl in the street. Good morning. Would you like me to take you home to have some food, she said. Food? Food? She took me to her home at 16 Rue de Lyon, and I met her, wait for it, family. Vive la mes primaire, they said, which is no substitute for sex. The girl was Daisy Setbon, 17, Jewish French, about 5 foot 5, olive skin with raven shoulder length hair. She showed us the sights of Tunis, which mostly consisted of drunken British soldiers kipping in the gutter. I wrote to her for ten years after the war, when suddenly her letters stopped. All inquiries brought no response. Of course. Plunger Bailey, it was him. The waiting game had paid off. That evening we were given a dinner at the Setborn's home, and as Al Files notes in his diary, had swell meal of spaghetti, beans topped up with best red Italian wine. Our truck is missing. We follow a trail of wine and dog ends and find it in the middle of a square. Standing in the driver's seat is another square, Gunner White. The truck full of Tunisians were taking it in turns to wear his hat. Stalin, Graham. Stalin. Comrades, what the kind of Worski is this? Here we are dying by the million, and you lot are laying about pissed in Tunis. Churchill, you can't stop them, Ski. If I report them, their mothers write to their MPs, and they report me to the King, Ski. Hmm? The Tunis Lovin. Tunis, 13th of May. The screwing has started. Young Lochinvars, prematurely aged with all night poking, were coming in at first light, paler than the dawn, collapsing on their beds and groaning, lovely. The great plunger Bailey decided that degrees of prowess should be recorded. A blackboard was hung on his lorry. Battery shags, as per May 1943. Gunner James, women involved, one. Number of times, six. Remarks, Trayvon. Lance Bombardier King, women involved, one. Number of times, one. Remarks, Brewer's Droop. Gunner Forest, women involved, one. Number of times, one. Death through natural causes. Gunner Plunger Bailey, women involved, twelve. Number of times, twenty. Remarks, resting. Edgington's face darkens. How can a man face the woman he loves after all this shagging? Said White, or you could say, darling, I've been keeping in training for you. It's been hard work, but worth the sacrifice. Or when it comes to my turn, darling, I'll be fit and ready for you. Edgington retaliated. You're throwing your love lives away, he said, laying back in his tent, his socks adrift on his feet and bent over at the ends. Oh, no. When I go to the marriage bed, I will go pure as the driven snow, which was some statement coming from a long white creature with four arms and knees burnt brown, wearing a vest which just covered his willy. Two sticking plasters on his inoculated arm, a haircut that made his head look like a coconut, and all of this covered with a fine layer of Tunisian dust. Picture the scene. Suddenly, at the mouth of the tent appears Betty Grable. She sees Edgington. Darling, she says slowly. He stands up, the pimples on his bare bum showing purple in the half-light. He takes her in his arms, and slowly they start to dance out of the tent across the dusty plain, in a cloud of dust, his sock slipping off and the tail of his vest flapping in the breeze. Who said romance is dead? Letters from Home 13th of May, 1943 Back home, Brother Desmond, filled with post-pubic patriotism, joined the air cadets. He and a gaggle of pimply freds were given an introduction in a cardboard cockpit. In his letter he said, One of us sits inside, another holds a model of a stuka, and we shoot it down. When my brother's turn came, he would give forth with the entire sound effects of the film Hell's Angels, which would end up with him crashing to the ground and dying. Then, raising himself on one elbow, he would shout, God straff England! It was all very praiseworthy and a complete bloody waste of time. My mother took up leather work at night classes. From then on, I received parcels of leather thongs, in case I needed them, 
Leather gloves with six fingers, leather belts in case I needed them. A pair of leather garters, a leather pay book cover to keep it dry. Leather prayer book cover, and then a spare leather prayer book cover in case the first got damaged in the fighting. I received the Lord's Prayer engraved on a leather medallion. It, it will protect you, she said. It didn't. The inside became covered in verdigris and turned my chest green. Were other mothers doing this? I didn't see other men in the regiment with green chests wearing initial leather garters and gloves with six fingers. My father was at the RAOC depot. He wore six guns and was teaching his men how to stop paratroopers with a quick draw. His way of stopping Hitler would be to invite him to a game of poker, then at a crucial stage call him Ein Cheat. Nazi newsflash. The scene, the old bar Auschwitz. Two guns blaze, Hitler falls dead. An amazed look on his face. Captain Milligan blows smoke from his guns. SS men step aside in fear. He backs out of the door. There is the sound of screeching brakes and he's knocked over by a dust cart. He had been a wonderful father and sometimes a wonderful mother, but he kept you on a permanent high. Returning from having seen Richard Dix in Cimarron, he'd kick our front door open, flatten against the wall and say, Cover me while I switch the hall light on. I remember watching the spectacular blaze of Crystal Palace from my bedroom window. Father observed it through binoculars. Finally, he lowered them and said, Navajo. My diary, 14th of May, 1943, to the afternoon of May the 15th. Try to get watches of Itai POWs. I approach Itai POW. You got TikTok, I said and did a superb mime of a watch. He took his boots off. No, 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 I said. Tick-tock, watch. I got one for 40 stale V cigarettes. They must have killed him within the week. I hope so. The watch didn't work. We got back to camp late. I woke up the sentry and said good night to him. May the 15th, 1943. Off to Tunis again. The Arab drains. Oh, Christ, said Edgerton. They're worse than Maunder's feet. Sure, I said. It takes a thousand years of Arab culture to build up a pong like this. Sniff it all up. Tourists pay for this. How do you know which one is there, said Divine, observing women in Perda. Easy. Outside every wog hut there's a weighing machine, and the husband just checks. Ah, it's Darlene, sixteen stone, three pounds. Oh, they must have stamina having twenty wives, said Divine. Oh, they don't do them all in one go. Ah, but it, it must be a temptation. I mean... Say you have it away with two. You doze off and you wake up at, say, uh, three o'clock. You get up for a glass of water and, well, it will go back to sleep when there's another 18 of them crawling up the wall. That's why men wear those long nightshirts in the daytime. They've got to be ready. Approaching our gunners, Musselwhite, Roberts and Wilson, riding donkeys and stoned. Days later, they were found in Seuss with no recollection of anything. Up before Major Chatterjack, the answer to his question, oh, what's your excuse, was pissed, sir. Well, such honesty cannot go unrewarded, said Chater Jack. Case dismissed. Udna, 13th of May, 1943. History of the regiment says we move to Udna. Well, I won't argue. I was to drive the Major. I chose you, Milligan, because you've never driven me before, and it's time I had another accident. It was a brief journey. Udna was a must for suicides. A barren plain bisected by a Roman aqueduct. Observing the ruins, Gunner Collins remarked, Ooh, Jerry did enough bomb that, didn't he? He was never commissioned. We arrived in a great cloud of dust which improved the place. Each soldier's features were obliterated. I could, however, tell many by the shape of their boots. May 15th, 1943. Eddington was standing outside my bivvy as I lay within. To an observer, it would appear he was talking to a tent. As I was asleep, that's exactly what it was. Lance Bombardier too rushes up. Leave is starting. Leave? Great! The ban were given from after parade on Friday to Monday midday. This is more like it, said Alf Files. Wars should be fought like this. We challenge the enemy to a holiday, and those who get the best one win. Hitlergram number 6140823. Hitler. Right. I challenge you. I will take three months at the Eagle's Nest in Birches Garden. Milligan. I challenge you with a week at Mrs. Terrible's boarding house, Hearn Bay. Hitler. A month at the Schloss Heidelberg on the Blue Rhine. Milligan. Ten days at Butlins, Clacton. Hitler. 
three months in the Gross Schlossen Schoenberger Palace in Vienna. Milligan, two nights at the YMCA Croydon. Hitler, six months, you hear? Six months in Gracie Fields Villa on Capri. Milligan, checkmate. Hitler, I don't accept checks, mate. You will have to pay cash. My diary, 16th of May, 1943. Off to Tunis POW camp to Scrounds. We enter the camp. Revenge is sweet, but not fattening. Lethen and Moston's Jewish soul was bent on revenge. He relieved Germans of their watches by the score. I'll see that these gifts are rewarded, he told them. This will get you extra rations, and handed them a chit, declaring, This is an anti Semitic bastard, knock the shit out of him. Edging discovered a field kitchen and a portable brothel. Terrible, said Wirt. The kitchen's full, the brothel's empty. Rummaging, they found some knackerbrot, ersatz coffee, and a selection of German cigarettes. Hitlergram number 96133A. Hitler, mein Gott, they are smoking our fags. That is terrible. Eva Brown, I know, I've smoked them. Hitler, to get our fags to Tunis, we had to go to Allied air raids on the factories, bombs on the railways, the boats to Africa are torpedoed, and the fags end up being smoked by that Huddersfield shit. Gonna fight. Eva Brown, it is not right and it is not fair. Hitler, what isn't? The left leg of Joe Louis. Hitler. I don't wish to know that. Kindly leave the bunker. Udna Idyll. 2.20. I lay in my tent. The heat was terrific. Flies and minute dive-bombing insects were at large. On the outside of the mosquito net they hung in dozens, waiting. Occasionally I displaced them with jets of cigarette smoke. Why should I suffer alone? And the next tent was Gunner White. What you doing? I said. I'm laying on me back, smoking a woodbine with me left hand and scratching me balls with me right. Say hello while you're there. I was thinking, he said, at this time back in England on a Saturday afternoon, you know what I'd be doing? No. I'd be in my bedroom, laying on me bed, smoking a woodbine with me left hand and scratching me balls with me right. What would you be doing? Me? I'd mow the grass in the garden, and my father would sit in a deck chair and encourage me with cries of, It does you good, lad. And I'd say to him, Why don't you do it then? And he'd say, Because it doesn't do me good. I've tried. This is a waste of bloody time. My life is going past. Time on a march, and here am I, on me back in bloody Udna, doing sweet F.A. This isn't living. This is, uh, this is, he fumbled for a word, couldn't find it, and settled for, Fucking terrible! What I need in life is variation, something different. Right, I said. Try smoking with your right hand and scratching your balls with your left. In his tent, Edgerton starts a tune. La da 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 dee dee. La da 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 da. Yes, red sails in the sunset, way out in the sea, he sang. I joined in harmony. This was taken up by Gunner White, and in the next tent to Edge, Gunner Tune. One by one, the entire tented camp joined in. I got up. I was the only person visible. From the sea of tents, the great chorus, Oh, carry my loved one home safely to me, soared over the sun-baked plain. No one would have believed it. I didn't. Udna. More letters from home. A parcel from home, two-thirds of which are, of course, holy medals of St. Patrick and St. Teresa. I only needed St. Andrew and I'd got the set. If I'd have worn every one sent to me, I'd have weighed twenty stone. Had I died, men searching for my identity discs might have said, Christ, he is St. Patrick. Lefton Walker wants to talk to me about the parcel. Uh, Major Chaterdeck has asked me to broach a delicate matter, he said. Uh, once in Bexhill you gave him a slice of your mother's fruitcake, which, as you know, he enjoyed full well. Uh, yes, that is so, sir, yes. Well, Milligan, he says that he had mentioned at the time that if ever you had another cake like it, he was... Uh, Willing to sample a reasonable slice. Well, I, I don't remember that, so. Well, he does. Now, there was a delivery of mail yesterday, and uh, he noticed that one parcel was for you, and on the label it said that among the contents was a fruitcake. Uh, that is so, sir. He says that to Caber, you received a cake and shared it among the command post staff. He said he was on duty at the time, but not actually in the command post, and when he heard of the cake, he came as quickly as he could. But it had all been eaten. Ah, yes, I remember that, sir. Uh, so does he. What I am coming to Milligan is this, that he would look on you in a kindly light if you were to give him a slice of cake which at this moment is in your tent. 
Oh, we've eaten the lot, sir. You bloody guts, Milligan! Uh, yes, sir. I wrote and told my mother of the incident, and lo, she sent him a whole cake, but this never stopped him catching mine. You see, said Edgerton, he's just a normal human being like us. He likes his grub. His grub, I said. We had a morning of Morse code training and equipment maintenance. Then came lunch. I ate a slice of spotted dick pudding before I realised that half the spots were dead flies. Momini Marsden had a lottery. At the end of the day, the one who presented most fly corpses won. And it was usually sanitary orderly little. How did he do it? Look, he explained, when you work with shit, you can't lose. We asked him for a percentage, arguing that our visits to his establishment helped attract the flies. With a temperature at 100 degrees, I caught the sort of cold one would catch on a freezing night in London while bathing naked in the Thames. You got a cold, mate, said Edgington. Yet I got a cold. How'd you get that? I bathed naked in the Thames on a freezing night in London. And what's wrong with you now, said the M.O.? A cold, sir. In this weather? Yet. That's like breaking your leg when you're asleep. Uh, that's something else I wanted to see you about, sir. Here, come and have a look at this, says Smudger Smith. He leads us across the plain to a cactus grove. There, hidden among the vegetation, is a stuker, brand spanking new. Oh, I wonder how much it's worth, said White. We swarmed over it, took turns to fiddle with the controls. The engine suddenly gave a tremendous cough. Here, what did you do then, said Smudge? Oh, I pressed a large red button, said White. For oh, Christ's sake, don't do it again. But White did do it again, didn't he? And the bloody engine started, and there we were with this throbbing monster, and pilot officer White screaming, How do you switch the bloody thing off? Don't waste it, I shouted. Bomb the cookhouse. It wouldn't stop. We stood around chucking rocks at the propeller. They bounced off and nearly killed us. It was still ticking over when we were visited by Major Chatterjack. He was furious and kept asking questions, all of which were obliterated by the roar of the engine. Unable to control himself, Chatterjack drew his Webley pistol and emptied it at the throbbing monster and drove off. 16th of May, 43. Good morning, Bomini Milligan, said Sid Price, fiddling with the camera. And what do you want? I wish to take a photograph of the Udna landscape. Well, there isn't one, I said. I know, said Price. Therefore, would you and a few like silly buggers care to pose in the foreground to relieve the monotony? The result is the only picture ever taken of Udna to prove that there's no such place. Uh, there's a battle scheme starting at 0600 hours tomorrow, said a military voice. And so there was. We were divided into opposing sides, Ack and Beer. By midday, thunder flashes kept exploding everywhere. Referees would rush up, chalk you with the white cross and say, you're dead. I asked Lieutenant Budden permission to throw a thunder flash under our vehicle so that we could play cards. Look, he said, let's have lunch first. He pointed to a cool conglomerate of date palms. A crowd of black-faced lunatics jumped us from behind bushes. You are all prisoners of the Ack Army, says Budden. But we are Ack Army. The attackers lowered their rifles, grinned sheepishly, and retreated. I thought we were Beer Army, sir, I said. Yes, we are, but we don't want everybody to know that, said Mr. Budden. The referee roars up. You're all casualties, he said, and marked us with white and red chalk. Sign here, said the referee. Three dead and two wounded. Dutifully Budden signed the chit. The sergeant saluted, mounted his bike, kicked the starter, which failed. He kicked it again. Then several agains. The starter kept sticking. Suddenly, when he wasn't ready, it shot back. With a scream, he clutched his shin. <laughs> well, he might. He'd broken it. He lay on the grass, and we radioed up an ambulance. Which one is hurt? said a soppy RAMC orderly. I think it's the one on the ground screaming, said Budden. As they put him on a stretcher, I marked him with red chalk. You bastard, he said. We returned to the base at the prescribed hour, where, dusty and weary, the battery took tea. We must never go to war again, said Devine. We've lost the knack. The great Edgerton gave forth. Oh, he says. Oh. The sound was from his trembling tent. I'm ill. I and my tent are very, very ill. And he was. He was sweating, steaming, shivering, groaning, parting. A versatile man. He thought me strange for contracting a coal in this climate, and now he'd done one better. He'd got pneumonia. No, he got two better. It was double pneumonia. 
We waved as they took him off to dock in a lorry. One man in an empty three-tonner. The army was like that. Dutifully, we rifled his tent for fags. General War Directive number 13694. Hitler. Hear that? One of the British army and his tent is ill. Let us attack now while they are under strength. I decided that we should climb the Roman aqueduct, and so Gunners Forest, Devine and Milligan set off. We walked briskly across the dusty plain. The morning was young, with a touch of pre-dawn coolness still in the air. You never know what you might find at the top, said Forrest. The aqueduct was built of giant stone blocks, no mortar or cement. Absolutely miraculous. When I tell Forrest and Devine, they get the shits. It, it, it'll fall over, they said, running clear. That's it, I said. It's been standing for two thousand years, and now it's going to fall over. We walked round the aqueduct and came to a low feature. Forrest scrambled up it. There, we've climbed it. Now let's all go home, he said. I was not put off. I led an assault up the ruins till we were a good fifty feet up. Close behind moaning was Forrest. If I wanted to be this high, he said, I'd have joined the bloody Air Force. I can't turn around, said Devine. Well, you're not missing anything, I said. It's no good, said Devine. I'm bloody stuck. It's all your bloody fault. And he was stuck. He stayed stuck for an hour. Despite all my implorings, he wouldn't budge. The sun was starting to set, and so apparently was Devine. For Christ's sake, I'd better do something. I think I already have, he said. Night was surging across the land. Exasperated, Forrest shouts, Help! Someone fetch a ladder! A ladder? Round here, you idiot, I said. All right, clever dick, what else can you do? Fetch a three-piece suite? An American plane flew over. Help! Fetch a ladder, I shouted at it. Suddenly an idea. Forrest, take your trousers off, I said. What? Tie them together as a rope. I'm not wearing any underpants, said Forrest. Living dangerously, eh? We knotted our trousers together and gradually we managed the descent. Devine's view from underneath must have been something. You've got moles on your balls, he said. It's a sign of beauty, said Forrest. It is a beauty, said Devine. <laughs> our descent was being observed by Major Chatterjack. He passed his binoculars to his batman. I don't know if my eyes are playing tricks, but there appear to be three men climbing the aqueduct with no trousers on. Oh, you're right, sir. They're not going to do it up there, are they? There the adventure ended. Next morning, Chatterjack said in passing... Uh, there's no need to climb the aqueduct again, Milligan. The water down here is perfectly safe. Victory Parade, 20th of May. There was to be a great victory parade in Tunis. Vigorous activity followed the announcement, some of it productive. A subsection gun was chosen for the occasion. Men swarmed over the piece. The result was a masterpiece of spit and polish. The 7.2 looked beautiful. Oh, my God, we'll never be able to fire that again, said Sergeant Ryan. We'll have to get permission from the Pope. May the 20th, 1943. The uh, beauteous artillery piece is limbered up and driven under wraps to Tunis. The parade. Not since Armistice Day Puna had I seen the like. On the saluting base were generals galore. Alexander, Eisenhower, Anderson, Admiral Cunningham, Mr. Macmillan. Past the rostrum marched an incredible mixture of soldiers, Camel Corps, Spahis, Americans, Scots, the Irish, the Guards, Gumiers, Greeks, Poles, Czechs, Gurkhas, Rajputs, tanks, armoured cars, and in the van came the free French with that exciting sound of bugles and drums, all followed by a small black dog. Pity I didn't have a camera. I'd have taken a picture of myself. Order to move number 16389-7639. We were to make a new camp on the hills at the back of Hammam Leaf, a seaside town just outside Tunis. It's a sort of Brighton with camels, said Gunnar Chu. Our convoy took us through Tunis and out the other side. At Hammam Leaf we turned off the coast road and climbed the winding back road into the semi-wooded hills of Jebel Bou Kurnim. There, on a plateau, we dispersed the vehicles and made camp. It had been whispered that Jerry indulged in drag activities. Now, what would I do if I had women's clothing in my big pack and the enemy were closing in? Put them on? No. Bury them. I started to prod the ground, and finding a soft surface, I dug down and lo, there, just below the surface, a brown dress, one pair of old-fashioned bloomers, one padded bra, 
brown silk stockings. I reported the find to Major Chatterjack. Major Chatterjack, I, I can't believe it, Milligan. Milligan, it's true, sir. You mean they dress up as women? Uh, someone had to, sir. No, I had heard rumours. Yes, they're very loud, sir. On a quiet night, you can hear the screams. He handed the evidence over to the Psychological Warfare Department, who arrived and questioned, above all things, me. A strange, long-haired corporal with a degree in psychiatry and B.O. said, uh, but why, why were you looking for women's clothes? I, I told him it was my day off. Do you, do you always look for women's clothes on your day off? Oh, yes. Why? It's an inexpensive hobby with hours of innocent fun. You see, I come from a large family, all girls. I could see his program psychiatric mind ticking on his predictable way. Did, did you, did you like dressing up? Oh, I loved it. Have you told anybody else this? Uh, my wife. But what does your wife do? She's in the Irish Guards. He gave me a terrible look and departed. I suppose right now he's sitting behind a desk giving some poor bastard tranquilizers and women's underwear. Hitlergram number 136, Hitler. Who has been giving mein Africa cocks the drag clothes? Himmler. It was me, mein Führer. Hitler. You dumb cop? You silly nana? Why the poofs do we have in the army? Himmler. Nix poofs, these are drag artists that are trained to keep up the morale of the boys. Hitler, what I hear, the boys have all been up the drag artists. How can I make mine Africa Corps make shoot bang fire with their sore asses? Himmler, but they like it, Manfuhrer. Hitler, like it? They must stop it. No more the brown hatting until the final victory. Give the order, stop all the brown hatting. Carthage. 22nd, 23rd, 24th of May. Our long weekend leave was about to start, Friday till Monday. Where to spend it? Edgerton, I said, as I sailed with a thousand-year-old blade, my face a sea of cuts. All my born days I wanted to see the ruins of Carthage. I think you've only got about a pint of blood left, said Edgerton. Ah, then I must hurry, I said. Oh, what's a Carthage? said Doug Kidgel. It's a great archaeological site. Oh, said Kidgel. Why are we going? You you got friends there? It's to improve my education, Kidgel. Can't we go to the pictures, said Kidgel. There's Bing Crosby in the road to Bali, in Tunis. That evening, excited as schoolboys, we drove along the Tunis Bazerta Road. It was as though the war didn't exist. Eventually, we pulled up on a sandy beach for the night. There was no moon, but the sky was a pincushion of stars. Great swathes of astral light blinked at us across space. We made a fire, glowing scarlet and cobalt-black darkness, showers of popping sparks jettisoning themselves into the night air. Tins of steak and kidney pud were in boiling water, with small bubbles rising to the surface. Be ready soon, said Doug, poking the fire, the only poke he would have for a long time. Files and Edgenon were making up their beds in the lorry, Edgenon singing while Files spoke to himself. Interesting to hear, a cigarette that bears lipstick, Traces. I think I'll put three blankets on top. An airline ticket to romantic places. It's going to be chilly later. A fairground's painted swings. Better keep my socks on tonight. These foolish things. Where's that bloody pillow? Remind me of you. Kidgel in the driving cab is finishing off a I love you forever letter. You don't write many letters, Milligan. That's right. I let them all worry. Well, what about your folks? Well, they worry about me all the time. Before the war, they worried if I went to the toilet. Even though I was in the garden, they'd shout out, Are you all right, son? They'd wake me up in the middle of the night and say, Are you all right? They're natural worriers. My father would wake up at three in the morning and worry about his job. And my mother would worry about him worrying about his job. Oh, they sound a mite strange, said Kidgel. A mite? They're insane. Every night when my father comes home from work, he gets his pistol out from under the stairs and shouts, Hitler, if you're in this house, come out with your hands up. Let me tell you, Kidgel, I'm bloody worried about them. We sat around the fire, opening the tins with a jackknife. You know, army cooks don't like tin food, said Kidgel. Well, why not, I said. They can't sod it up in tins. They're like fresh stuff, so they can burn the Jesus out of it. The motto of the army catering corps is, help wipe the smile off a soldier's face. Got him, said a triumphant editor, smashing a mosquito on his wrist, sending his marmalade pudding flying into the fire. Bagger, he said, trying to retrieve it with a stick. In a food frenzy, he dashes to the lorry, returns at speed with a rifle and bayonet. 
It was a heroic sight as he lunged time after time to retrieve the blackened duff. Don't forget, I said, thrust, turn, withdraw. Gentlemen, a surprise. I produced a small bottle of schnapps. It fell off the back of Major Shetterjack's truck. That, said Edgerton, is a spoil of war, and he struck a dramatic finger-pointing pose. Well, it's not going to spoil mine, I said, pouring out the white liquid. Alf sipped and grasped his throat. Christ! If they drink this, they are the master race. It was fiery stuff. Ah! It'll kill us, said Edgerton. He spat a mouthful on the fire. It exploded in a sheet of flame. See? When you go to the bog, for Christ's sake, don't strike a match. With the drink, we mellowed. Harry got hiccups. He said, I wonder what's going to happen to us next. We didn't have long to wait for the answer. A spark shot out of the fire and burnt him. Ah! We sat close to the fire. The smoke kept the mozzies away. And an occasional brave one would die underhand as it landed. Silly sods. I wouldn't risk my life to pass on malaria, said Files. I think I'll turn in, he said. Through the night, a three-ton lorry, with a mosquito net across the back, was home for four lads from London, who slept sounder and safer than those in bomb-ridden London. It seemed all wrong, but it was all right by me. A letter told of my eccentric father's career as a captain. He had decided that the RAOC depot at Reigate was wide open to paratroop attacks. He took it upon himself to make a lifelike raid on the depot. He briefed a dozen NCOs. They chose midday. The officers are in the mess having a pre-lunch piss-up. The men are queuing in the mess hall. Suddenly, the cookhouse staff are surrounded by men with black faces and tommy guns. The leader is speaking in a strange patois. Hands up, schnell. Get against that beating wall, Englander, please. In the officers' mess from behind a bar arose five more men with blackened faces, one wearing a German helmet and holding a machine pistol. Last orders, please, and hands up. It was my father. The officers were then locked in an office where it was simple to phone the police. A constable arrived, and my father then explained the whole scheme. The colonel said, You're a bloody fool, and had him posted to RAOC Elstree. We were all up at first light and away through Tunis on the Carthage Road. Let's play some games, I said. I made up the first line, and you have to rhyme the next one. There was a young gunner called Harry, Kijol, told the M.O. he wanted to marry. Eds, the M.O. said, oh, Alf, is it Bexhill Flo? He said, no, it's old Calcutta Curry. The blue Mediterranean flanked the road. We were as free as would we ever be in our lives. We pulled up at a lonely beach and plunged into the azure waters. With Edgerton as base man, we repeatedly tried balancing on each other. We got as far as three, then collapsed with great artificial screams and dramatic plunges into the briny. One of us would submerge and sing a song, and from the rising bubbles you had to guess what the tune was. Life was golden, and we were the assayers. Evening. We made camp by a sandy verge. We ate and talked. At 9.30 we bedded down. Good nights were exchanged. At midnight, though, we were still talking. This is marvellous, isn't it? said Edgerton. I don't like going to sleep. I'll, I'll miss it. Doug. Holidays in Africa. Core. Edge. You go on quiet, Al. Al. I was thinking of Lily. Me, you dirty little devil. Sleep with your hands on top of the blankets. Al. You don't know what true love is, Milligan. There are too many birds in your life. Me. Oh, I spread my investments. I keep as many on the ball as I can. I got seven going for you back in England. See now, there's Edge. Look out. He's going to have a roll call. Me. Miss Beryl, Marie, Kay, Ivy, Madge, Betty, Dot, Doris. Doug, company, stand there, ease. Al, don't these birds ever find out about each other? Me, no, I keep the door locked. Edge, you're an evil swine, Milligan. With all that shagging, it's going to drop off one day. Doug, believe me, it won't have to make a noise when it hits the ground. <laughs> we awoke at first light and played Who's Going to Make the Tea? By ten past nine, no one had given in. Finally, Edge arises, bent double with bladder bursting. All right, I'll make it. Well, he'll only just make it, I thought. We heard him tinkering around outside, and he broke into a little tune. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I'm under your spell, but how can I help it? Don't blame... Bugger! How's he going to rhyme that, I thought. 
he'd burnt himself. With Edgington, striking a match could lead to anything. Edgington tying a bootlace could end up with a broken arm. Edgington cutting his toenails could mean an amputated leg. Come and get it, he called, and we got it. Fried eggs and sand. It was just after 10 a.m. when Doug put the lorry in gear and started following the signs. What happened uh, at this place, Carthage, said Doug, who was still puzzled. Well, er, uh, I explained it was a great naval power. It had a war with Rome. I forget the score. The Romans raised the city and ploughed the ground with salt. How do you know all that, said Doug. Same as encyclopedia, I said. As a kid, I loved reading. Given a chance, I could have been a great scholar, even university. You could have been a great university. Everyone ought to get a university education, said Al. I reckon if Harry had been through university, he might be writing concertos now instead of burning himself making tea. I, I think he'd burn himself writing a concerto, I said. <laughs> Chambers Encyclopedia, said Harry. I thought that was the history of pisspots. That morning, Kitchell burst into songs. Love, let me taste the wine from your lips. And then went into hysterical laughter. He's going off his nut, said Edgerton. It happens to short asses like him. Doug frowned, smiled and grimaced as only a facial cripple could. Short ass men are all well known for their power. You take Nelson. You're not, said Files. You're not lumping yourself in his class. The smile played across Kidgel's face. Answer, answer, shouted Edgerton, banging his fist on the dashboard and cutting his finger. Yes, said Kidgel, I do. I have the same short ass qualifications as him. It's just that I never had the same chances. Al turned and looked at Kidgel. What are you staring at, he giggled. Christ, chuckled Al. You in charge of the HMS victory? How do you know, said Kidgel, that inside me there isn't a brilliant naval tactician? Say R, I said, and I'll look for him. Firstly, you look more like a half Nelson, said Edgington. <laughs> all right, all right. You think what you want. I still say short asses have a greater power over their fellow men by reason that they're nearer the ground and haven't got so far to fall. That baffled a lot of us. We gave up. Edgington was bending his fingers over each other to make what, what we called crab claws. I learnt this as a nipper, he said. We set off again, sucking our rations of boiled sweets. We were doing fifteen miles an hour, and at that speed you could say, Look at that. But at modern speeds it's, did you see that? Finally! Carthage. We parked by a clump of trees and walked to the ruins of the amphitheatre. It was almost featureless now. What a sight it must have presented, clad in marble, as high as El Gem, the sun of Africa reflecting its white surface, the roar of the crowds, the blood, the mangled remains, rather like Celtic versus Rangers. Is, is this it? said Doug disappointedly. Yes. Is this what I miss Bing Crosby on the road to Bali for? It's terrible. It looks like Catford. Wait a minute. One minute you're allying yourself with Nelson, and when you see history you say it's Catford. You sort us. I only brought you here because the ruins were low enough for you to see over. Well, says Kidgel, I still say a Carthage is not as good as Bing Crosby in the road to Bali. We brewed our tea on the floor of the arena. It was hard to believe blood spilled here 2,000 years ago. Finally, we up-anchored and drove on. Eventually. Doug picked a spot adjacent to a heavily bombed French maritime repair docks. Ah, said Kitchell, this looks more like a Carthage. He backed the truck under a large tree. A small group of Arabs with three donkeys and a camel are passing towards Tunis. They sell us oranges, eggs, dates, and things that look and taste like pistachio nuts, mainly because they were. After a day of swimming, we are all in bed smoking and talking. Ah... Uh, got to be back tomorrow by midday. Sod it, said Doug regretfully. Good night, lads, yawned Edgington. Steady, I said. You haven't had an accident for an hour. Back to the battery. We arrived back dead on time, six hours late. What's this? Move at dawn again? Where to? Somewhere else, we were told. We're always somewhere else, I said. This bloody moving said what? I should write to my MP. Well, why don't you then? "'Cause he's a cunt, that's why. "'He's in the Navy, second-class stoker. "'Well, you voted him in. You're all cunts.' "'No, why not? Huddersfield's a very intelligent town.' "'Huddersfield? They're at the bottom of the third division. "'Because all the players are in the army. "'You know how old the current goalie is?' "'No. Sixty-eight. "'He's had thirty-nine goals and two heart attacks last season.'
The move from Hammam Leaf. My diary, May the 27th, 43. We leave Hammam Leaf and move to destination secret. Secret, said White. Soon there'll be six bloody regiments there. How do you keep that lock quiet? If we was tourists, how much would this trip cost us, said Eddington. Oh, thousand, said White. Ah, yes, said Gunnar Maunders, but this is travelling third class. He was speaking from an agonised position atop reels of signal wire, sans boots and socks, with his feet reeking in the heat. White was stretched on a pile of blankets, most of which were in better nick than him. He was about to light the briefest of dog ends. I pondered on how he could do it without scorching his nose. Amazingly, he produced a piece of cardboard which he slipped under his nostrils, a sort of kind of a fire guard. Necessitas et mater inventum, said the learned Bombardier Deans. What's that mean? said White. It means, Gunnar White, doesn't speak Latin. Who needs Latin? said White. It's a dead language, said Edgington. But he just spoke it and he's not dead. Ah, but he learnt it when he was, I said. Lunch. In the shade of the olive trees, we sat and ate our sandwiches and then drove on. Life was timeless. Deans was running through a, an old copy of Filmgoer, about a year old. I see it. Clark Gable has joined up. He's an air gunner, he said. Well, that's not a very big part, said White. The war has been badly cast, I said. I should be playing the part of a rich, conscientious objector living with Joan Blondel, who has to be massaged nude every hour with hot chocolate. Posters on the tree are calling on the French to join l'Ami Libre Francais. Bloody fool, said Maunders. Oh, he wouldn't join up because of a bloody poster. Haven't you ever heard of patriotism, said Deans? Suppose Jerry invaded England and tried to screw your sister. What would you do? I, I couldn't do nothing, could I? I'm in bloody North Africa. May the 30th, 31st, 1943, 1st of June. We're here, said someone. We're here was a place called Ainabessa. We all leapt enthusiastically from our lorries to be confronted by another desolate plain with a slight rise in the middle. That rise, gentlemen, said Lieutenant Button, is home. The heat was stifling. Even the crows were walking. I saw Ronald Coleman in bow jest, and he never sweated like this, said Bombardier Fuller. Ah, oh, perhaps they shot it in Norway, I said. My father had told me there's always more breeze on a slope, so I leaned to the left but felt no cooler. Evening came. I filled my water bottle for the night and took Mepocrine. I couldn't sleep. Why was there a war? Could it have been avoided? Why didn't I avoid it? By now I could have been making my own way as a trumpet player through the ranks of big bands. Perhaps one day I would play with Tommy Dorsey and screw Helen Forrest. By dawn's early light, I wasn't in Tommy Dorsey's band. The only screw was holding up the tent pole. The cookhouse wagon was missing. I don't miss it at all, said White. We ate the remains of yesterday's haversack rations, which now look like an operation. After parade, we spent all day putting signal gear into a Nissan hut and testing the equipment. By midday, the cooks had arrived. Ta-da! We stood in the boiling sun, watching the sweating cooks as they ladled out McConaughey's and rice pudding, and we retired to our tents to escape the flies. My bivvy was roomy. I had increased its height by adding a three-foot purple canvas wall along the trailing edge and dug down three feet so I now had more headroom. An electric light ran from the truck, there was a wireless set by the bed, and the fridge was on order. Over the roof I had put a fly sheet, making the tent some ten degrees cooler. One afternoon, Edgington and I were practising post-war sleeping when the distant voice of Lance Bombardier Sherwood was heard. Oi! You in there! Hello, that's me. I bet I can get you out of that tent in minutes too. Me. Balls! I bet you ten francs. Done, I said. Right, minutes two starting now. We dozed on. Minutes one and forty seconds, shout Sherwood. I hear a combustion engine approaching. I have a nasty feeling. I raise the tent flap. A Bren carrier is nearly upon us. The bastard! He put it in bottom gear, pointed it at our tent, and let it loose unmanned. Fuck, he's going to win, said Edgerton. No, he's not. Grab the tent pole, and I'll take this one. We ran away to the left. That was cheating, said Sherwood, 
as he unscrews his wallet. He had to run 400 yards after the Bren, and we had to reset up our tent, all for 10 francs. We were all bloody mad. The Arabs had rifled the tombs of the pharaohs, and now it was our turn. Chalky White was asleep. A brown hand came under the tent flap. White hit it with a pick handle, and there was an agonised, Oh, fucking hell! It was Gunnar Devine, feeling for White's fags. Karata Gorge, Holiday 2nd of June, 1943 Cheta Jack realised Einabessa was lowering morale, so again he set up more holidays. With Lieutenant Budden and Sergeant Dawson in charge, the Gunners Edgington, Files, Shipment, Tomb, Carter, Bombardier Deans and Milligan drove to the Karata Gorge. Through torturous mountain roads we drove amid magnificent wild scenery. The road had been hewn from solid granite, and on the floor of the gorge was a giant engraved stone, La Travée du Militaire Français, 1882. It was a masterpiece of construction. Gradually, through a series of tunnels, the road descended to the floor of the gorge, level with the river Agrion. Adjacent was perfect ground for camping. We pitched our eye-tied ten-man tent under a tree facing the river. The backdrop to all this was the great Kabyle range of mountains. Soon, the quiet of the gorge was broken by shouts and splashing. The walls of the gorge rose 300 feet, and growing in abundance by the stream were pink and scarlet rhododendrons. With towels wrapped round our middles, we sat in the shade. Alphile strummed his guitar. Come with me to blue Hawaii. It's a pity we can't share this with the poor buggers from home, he said. We are the poor buggers from home, I reminded him. Lefton and Cecil Button swims without his specks, colliding with rocks, cliffs and driftwoods, and comes out with a mass of bruises. I can see him now, with those magnificent PT shorts hanging below the knee like wet concertinas. Edgington. Now there was style. Again those draggly drawers, the cheeks of his bottom just peekabooing above the elastic waist. He was somewhere in the Tarzan stroke Gregory Peck mould, I think. His approach to the dive was to make a 50-yard momentous run-up, reach the water, trip and fall face in. As he surfaced, usually upside down, he put on that man of action and sport and labour exchange look, and then, with an overarm stroke, he would set off, a look of determination on his fine face. Gradually he would sink from sight, the only man in the world who had learned to swim downwards. There was no organisation. Someone cooked one day, someone else another. It worked out very fairly, especially for me. I did bugger all. Climbing Karata Gorge, 3rd of June, 1943. It was first light, a cool morning, with the sound of the river singing in the dawn. Hands off, cocks! Onward, socks! said a voice. As we unravel ourselves from the blankets, there was the usual, anyone seen my boots, socks, teeth, trousers, etc.? It seemed like every night a giant spoon came and stirred the whole contents of the tent into a great cloth porridge. What's for breakfast? Al Files points to something on the pan. It's brown and black, but it tastes green. Is it an omelette, I said. That is the current opinion, said Lefton and Button. So then it was up the gorge. It was tiring, but not dangerous. But to Edgington, that was dangerous. We crossed the road to the west wall, where a clear water stream was falling from above. I suggested that we follow it. I said, look, there is a clear water stream falling from above. I suggest we follow it. We started to ascend, grabbing tufts of grass, bushes, roots and each other. At a hundred feet we paused on a small plateau where a pool had formed. Scuttling about in its depths were freshwater shrimps. Cool, said Chum. How did they get up here? They climbed up the water, I said. The morning was gradually going from warm to hot, and we went with it. At about 200 feet it became a bit precipitous. People were saying, Whose silly idea was this? We should be roped together, said Edgerton, whose position appeared to consist of one foot above his head on a ledge, and the other one dangling in space. Indeed, Edgerton should have been roped together. We had reached 300 feet, and the top seemed no nearer. Someone keeps adding a bit on, explained Dean. A brief description of the flora. Among the trees I saw Portuguese and Afari oak, elm and ash. The shrubbery around 
was a mixture of strawberry tree, myrtle, and woody climbers such as clematis. They were in various stages of flower and gave off a beautiful perfume at night, which was usually lost in clouds of reeking tobacco smoke. I can smell dinner, said Edgington, now in the shape of a swastika. Look! He pointed down to the camp way below, where Files was stirring a large pot over a fire. The mention of food was fatal. Immediately, the mast legs started downwards like homing pigeons. We all drew nigh to Alf Files with sharp appetites. What's cooking then, we asked. It's my laundry, he said. Whereupon we taketh Gunner Edgington and throweth him in the river. Budden came forth to see a soldier swimming fully clothed. What are you doing, man, he asked. I'm teaching my battle dress to swim, sir. June the 5th, Friday, 1943. There's wild pigs up the mountain. The information was imparted by one Mahmoud, an Arab who came scrounging fags, and whose head was therefore a mass of lumps. He would act as our guide if we wished a pig for dinner. Marvellous! And none of us were Jewish. Alf Files' diary reads, Sergeant Dawson and party set off with rifles and ammo, have dug three graves. We left at 1900 and were taken up a mountain path that brought us to a plateau. We arrived as the light faded. We climbed a tree and waited. Midnight, all fags gone. We are losing hope. Suddenly in the silence, Mahmoud let off a terrifying Arab fart. Christ, said Geordie Dawson. Oh, no wonder the crusade is lost. I fell out of the tree laughing. The hunt was over. We trudged back to camp. Bombardier Dean was sharpening a carving knife. Uh, you tell him, Sarge, you're the biggest. Dean's took the news well, and he tried to commiserate by saying, You're a lot of cunts. We could have gone to bed. Whereupon Gunner Edgington accidentally looses off a round that nearly parts Bombardier Dean's hair. That bloody does it, says Dean's. The night was saved from complete disaster by things called sausages. We ate in silence. Pass the wine, said Edge, who himself had been passing wine for months. Sergeant Dawson was occupied with the whiskey bottle, trying to wean himself off food. After the war, I'm going to go back to my old job, said Gunner Shipman. What old job? Uh, any old fucking job. Finally, at about three in the morning, the chilly night air drove us to our beds. An unforgettable day. Last day at Karata. June the 6th, 1943. My diary. Last day. We swam at first light, and I wish we hadn't. It was bloody cold. Edgington was cringing in the water, his teeth chattering and singing his latest hit. Each chilly, on your willy, in the water, in Karata. Rubbish, I said. Rubbish, she replied. If Cole Porter was writing this stuff, they'd be lapping it up. It's only my words against his. Now, a mystery. Why we all should go? Mineral rock hunting escapes me. But however we did, we started to search the area. What's a fossil, said Edge. That's the birthmark of a dead animal, I said. Ah, he said. He didn't get us anywhere. There, there might even be gold around here. So, gold, gold, eh? Oh, gold. Soon our pockets were bulging, and we would ask Button's advice. After all, he was a university man and an officer. Not only that, he was also intelligent. When we arrived back, he was not only a university man and an officer and intelligent, but dead asleep with his mouth open. Don't wake him up, I said. He might be dreaming of promotion. We carefully sorted the rock samples into various categories that we knew. Big and small. It was gone three when Budden arose, and such was his condition that his first words were, we must be ready by midday. We showed him the samples, hopefully. They're rocks, he said. We told him we knew that, and he said so did he. Aren't they valuable, sir, I said. I don't know, he replied. What a fine officer, I thought. He could have lied and said yes. They are gold-bearing of high degree, but no. He had fought back the temptation and deprived us of a fortune. We had our final swims, and then we set off back to Ainabessa. Extract from Battery Orders by Major F. Chetajak, DSO MC, commanding 19 stroke 56 Heavy Regiment, Royal Artillery. Information. The battery will be interested to learn that they hold the record for the greatest number of 7.2 rounds per gun fired in 24 hours. 
The figure is 220 on the 23rd of April, 1943, and these, as will be remembered, were on the targets involving the fight for Longstop, the battery positions being then at Tukabur. The next highest figure is 134 rounds per gun, fired by two other batteries of 56th Heavy Regiment, during the final attack on the 6th of May, 43, when two armoured divisions broke through to Tunis and the peninsula. Third comes a figure of 80 rounds per gun, also fired by 19 battery on the 24th of April, 43, during the final assault and capture of Longstop. During the final Battle of Majorda Valley, between 22nd of April and 6th of May, 19 battery fired a total of 2,340 rounds, the next highest of any 7.2 battery being 15,064. F. Chater Jack, Major R.A. 2,340 rounds? No wonder we're all shagged out. 12th of June, 1943. Sergeant Dawson and his pissy friends had spent all night at a cafe in Karata village on the booze. They arrived back at dawn, awoke me with a mug of tea loaded with whiskey. Half awake, I downed the lot. In ten minutes, I was raving drunk and had to be held down by Smudger Smith and three gunners. Hitting me lightly with rifle butts, they carried me screaming to a distant tent. What's all that shouting coming from the direction of Algiers, said Major Chetajek. It's a bomber of milligans, sir, said Dawson. He's running through some ideas for the band. You sure you hasn't caught them in a rat trap? No, sir. They're outsides. Wednesday, 9th of June, 1943. Sitting outside his tent, swigging warm beer, Sergeant Frank Donaldson tells me the truth about the battle at Elarusa wagon lines on February 26-27. One morning, a large cloud of dust disappeared through the wagon lines. What was that? said Donaldson. It's our front line, was the reply. They received an order, fuck off as quickly as you can. But BQMS Courtney told Donaldson, stay behind to defend the road. There isn't one, said Donaldson. That's not my fault, said Courtney, and departed. Donaldson and co. noticed a stew simmering for lunch. They were about to partake of it when the convoy roared back again, snatched up the stew, and disappeared for a second time. A lieutenant wearing a ragged green berry arrived on a lady's bicycle and said he was from the reconnaissance corps. He suggested they climb a hill to see what the noise on the other side was. They saw it, and to a man they sit themselves. There. Forming up were massed German infantry and Tiger tanks. There was a hasty retreat to the foot of the hill. The lieutenant ordered everyone to stay put and then buggered off. They heard tanks approaching and there was further stomach trouble. Gunner Forrest pointed to a pile of rocks and abandoned pick handles. Oh, we'll need them, said Forrest. What for, said Donaldson. Said Forrest, when tanks come, we chuck rocks at the turret and when the bloke inside opens the turret to see what the noise is, we hit him on the head with a pick handle. I could hear the screams of Kamerad as the vicious pick handles bit deep into the four inch plate armour. Lucky for Donaldson, Churchill tanks of the North Irish horse came on the scene and saved them for a fate worse than, well, worse than a cold stew for dinner. <laughs> Chater Jack had cheerfully told the mayor of Satif that he had un bel orchestre de jazz. So we found ourselves playing at a thé dansant where 500 gunners tried to dance with two girls and an old French matron with a face like Schnossel Durant's pulled inside out. The place, I recall, was the Salle de Fête. Edinburgh called it a fate worse than death. As I lay in bed that night, a voice was heard singing, No rose in all the world until you came. It was full of tender meaning. The voice floated on the night air. In the silence of the giant continent, it seemed strange to hear that voice, a young English voice. The song continued and soared until it concluded on a high, exquisite, delicate falsetto. Silence settled on the land, then a voice spoke. Tank fuck, he's finished! It was one of those little cameos that lightened the darkness. French Concert Party Friday, 18th of June, 1943 Milligan, band is to report to 74th Medium's music playing for the uses of. At 74th Medium's camp, we were greeted by our empty back captain, who appeared to be training for death. I'd like you to do a turn in the middle of the show. When I said, the middle of the show, he definitely said miggle. So he couldn't pronounce his D's. 
How would you like to be announced? I paused. A uh, deep battery dance duo and dug on drums. Carefully he wrote it down. Would we like winks? Winks? Oh, OK, we'd love some winks. The stage consists of a trestle table covered with blankets. I am a trumpet player covered in battle rests. A charabank arrived with the Algiers Opera Company. First to alight was soprano Mademoiselle Beth Vignon. She must have been fifteen stone. The charabank rose three feet when she got off. Cor, said Harry. There's enough for all of us. She was followed by a petite soprano, Mademoiselle Garcia. You're mine, all mine, said Doug Kidgel, clutching his parts. Next came a crazed, mop-headed French-Algerian pianist. A tent had been erected for the ladies to change in. Gunnar Little detected a hole in it. What he saw set his testicles revolving. Mademoiselle Villon was sitting on a stool, naked, making up. Little, a sporting man, spread the word. My God, the size! How could she sit in one spot and still be in several other places at the same time? The concert started, and finally it was our turn. The captain announced, I have great pleasure in announcing Guy Gatry Ganskan with Gargon Grungs. Got him, I thought. We belted through our numbers, got a great reception, and then cleared for Mademoiselle Garcia. During the interval, a human being dressed up as a gunner approached me. Uh, you don't know me for madam, he said. I told him he must be better dressed. A stranger was Gunner Snatchel, or brief name Snatch, from the 8th Survey Regiment. He said he played the violin, and could he sit in on the next session? OK, we said. He turned out he was great, a real good jazz violin player, though the fact that he appeared with a garland of wild flowers around his head was a bit disconcerting. Mademoiselle Villon in a black dress was approaching, her bosoms going on ahead of her by ten seconds. You play the jazz very good, you naughty boy, she said. Help! Massage, I said weakly. We listened spellbound as she sang the Habanera from Carmen. Her voice was pure silver. In the warm African night, it was an unforgettable experience, with the moon shining down on those lovely white boobs. She stopped the show, but then she was big enough to stop anything. The show over, we waved the French artist and her boobs goodbye. A letter from Snatchel reminds me how that evening concluded. I remember the French enter Charabank disappearing into the night, and then afterwards Harry, Al, Doug and I in the back of a three-tonner with a quarter moon palm trees, a new on guitar playing and singing Come rain, come shine. Birth of the Two Agra Concert Party 19th of June, 43, part two orders. It has been decided to form a concert party. Anyone who has the ability to entertain will parade tomorrow at 10 hundred hours. Map reference 345-675. Five, five. This turned out to be a deserted field and a tree. At ten o'clock, trucks with the uh, artistes appeared. The judges were Captain Graham Lehman, Lance Bombardier Ken Carter, and a regimental padre who shall remain anonymous. A man would step forward, click his heels and say, Hi, will now sing Holy Rose. Burst into song, finish and salute. It must have puzzled, nay, baffled the Arabs. For what possible reason was that English infidel doing a vigorous soft shoe shuffle in the middle of a field, gradually disappearing in a cloud of dust, and finally coming to attention and saluting two men standing under a tree. I'd seen many army auditions, and I recall one at Hailsham. A crowd of soldiers had turned up to find the stardom. It's a fact that an idiot doesn't know he's an idiot. He may think he's a great singer or dancer. The auditioning officer said, First one, please. A squat Scot with a terrible squint and a Glaswegian accent stepped forward. Rifle McDolly, sir. And what do you do? I'm a musician, sir. The what do you play? A uh, spoons. The what? Spoons. Spoons. That you eat your dinner with. Ah, yes, spoons. Do you have any music? Yeah, I can't read music, sir. I'm naturally gifted. Producing two spoons, he started. I should like to... Pay my tribute to the late George Gershwin by whistling Rhapsody in Bloom. It was appalling. It had nothing to do with Rhapsody in Bloom. He frequently dropped the spoons with cries of, Oops, sorry, sir, and then would start all over again. 
The audition continued with soldiers who thought the world could be entertained by walking on hands, or doing cartwheels, press-ups, somersaults, and standing on their head. One idiot's act consisted solely of falling flat on his back. Is that all? said the officer. Yes, sir. It takes it out of you. Well, take it out of here, was the reply. But from the auditions at map reference 345675 in North Africa came the best British soldier show of the war. 21st of June, 1943. It was a great day for Al Files. He won 195 francs on Nasrallah in the Derby. He felt good and decided to buy Lad's drinks. It cost him 200 francs. 22nd of June, 1943. Ziyama was a bay on the coast of North Africa. It was as unspoilt as at the beginning of time. So the army decided to fuck it up and build a naffy in a rest camp there. The beach was copper-coloured. Sunlight reflecting from the bottom gave the water a shimmering Caesar's royal purple colour. Behind us were scrub-covered hills with acacia trees where occasional troops of Barbary apes could be seen, their little black faces peering down on their less fortunate brethren. We had enjoyed a day of peace, sunshine and naffy. In the evening, without any warning, comes a cloud of red dust travelling at a hundred miles an hour. It tries to blow the camp into the Mediterranean. But we find safety inside the lorries. We watch as tents are wrenched from the ground and blown out to sea, revealing the startled occupants still in bed. Staff wrestle to hold down the naffy marquee, flapping like a giant eagle about to take off. A stream of cups, saucers, spoons and buns shot out the sides. The manager is yelling, Save the Tians! To add to it, monkeys are being blown through the camp. They seek refuge in trucks, huts, etc. The Hessian wall of Laterine shoots skywards, revealing a line of straining figures on poles, hanging on like grim death to the straining bar. The wind was the famous North African Sirocco. The sand was like a whiplash on the skin. We shelter in the driving cabs with the windows up. Men are running after their kit. It's very dark. A monkey has bitten a gunner who tried to shoo him out of the back of his lorry. A fire has broken out on the distant hills. The skyline is aflame. Has anyone phoned the fire brigade, said Gunner Knott. The number's Bradford 999. It's next to the mortician shop. I remember it caught fire one night and burnt all the stiffs. We were in the cafe next door eating eggs and chips. What startling news, I thought. By midnight, it had blown itself out. The camp was in a state of chaos. The naffy sergeant was swearing. Those bloody monkeys have eaten all the fucking buns. Oh, they'll be dead in a week, said Kijel. He should know. Next day, I'm floating on the waters, when Lieutenant Budden calls me from the shore. Come in, Ghana, number 954024. Your time is up. We were to pack up at once and report to Lance Bombardier Carter for duty with the new concert party. There was a lot of swearing from the lads. What a bloody thing to do on the second day of our leave. Got no respect for the dead. So, back to Ainabessa. We returned at sunset. I wasn't pissed, but there, on a trestle table, was a seven-foot-long hammerhead shark. Apparently, the Major and Sergeant Max Mulliner set forth from Ziyama in a rubber dinghy and started fishing with grenades. Suddenly, a monster with eyes on a bleak stalk shot up. Shark! Rove, Sergeant. He already was. They got ashore, observed the monster was still floating on the top, and rowed back. Chater Jack, with a loaded pistol, just stopped himself from saying, Hands up. The creature was dead, and here it was, frying on a griddle and smelling delicious. Any chance of... No, there fucking isn't, said the cook. Ask the Major. From inside the Major's tent, I can hear straining of the type one only hears from a gent at Leicester Square. Uh, Major Chatterjack, sir. Milligan, can't you see I'm busy? More heavy straining, followed by a purple gasp. What was he doing? Did he wear a secret appliance? There follows a, a creaking, unoiled heen sound, a gigantic heave, and the unmistakable sound of a cork from a bottle. A great exhaling of breath, followed by a pause, a swallowing sound, and then... Ah! Now! Now, what is it, Milligan? It was a different man speaking. It's about the shark, sir. It hasn't bitten you, has it? I bargained for a slice of shark in exchange for my next fruitcake. To duplicate the taste of a hammerhead shark, boil old newspapers in Sloan's liniment. Suddenly came the bad news. Major Chatterjack was being transferred to another regiment. Sadly, he told us, I'm leaving you all. I don't want to, but it's promotion, and you know what that means. More lolly, said a voice. Sergeant Griffin chirps up. 
We are sorry to see you go, sir, and we wish you the best of luck, or something like that. It didn't matter. With his going, the battery was never the same again. We'd never been the same before, but now we were never going to be the same again. The new Major. His name was Evan Jenkins. His physique? He didn't have one. The nearest description? Tutankhamun with the bandages off. His neck measurement would be 11 inches, including his shoulders. When a strong wind blew, he had to hold his head to stop it from snapping off. His Adam's apple stuck out like a third knee, and when he swallowed, it disappeared down the front of his shirt and made him look pregnant. His arms must have been sent from Auschwitz. They were, for all the world, like two pieces of string with knots tied where the elbows were. His legs were like one of Gandhi's split in two. His eyes were so close together, to look left or right, one of them appeared to cross the bridge of his nose. He had a pair of outsized ears which attracted flies. He'd got him the nickname Jumbo, but despite his comic appearance, he was a real bastard. He had us taking our bootlaces out and ironing them so they were nice and flat. He made us use toothpaste on webbing to make it nice and white while our teeth went black. At night he'd sit in his tent and play Whistling Rufus on his clarinet, and every morning he could be heard gargling with TCP and then spitting it back in the bottle, the mean sod. He insisted on giving us cultural lectures. The sergeant, who shall remain nameless, said, Hey, Strent, now then, today the Major will be talking about, here he referred to a piece of paper, Keats. Keats. I don't suppose one of you ignorant bastards knows what a keat is. Edding and I decided to get our tent as far away from Jumbo as possible, so we found a distant wadi over which we rigged up a canvas cover. Efforts to sabotage Jumbo were partially successful. We managed to impregnate the reed of his clarinet with soap, and he gave his batman hell over it. But it was by the battery cook, Ronnie May, that real revenge was wrought. May had collected dried goat shit, pounded it into a flour, mixed it with real flour and mashed potatoes. This mixture appeared on Jumbo's plate as rissoles, which he ate and asked for more. Now he really is full of shit, said May. The sky was blackening. It was going to rain. We could do with it, said Edge. Do what with it, I said. Well, for a start, he said, you can accept it. The heavens open and rain deluged down. The concise Oxford Dictionary says, Waddy, dried up watercourse, filling quickly in rainy season. We didn't have the Oxford Dictionary, but we found how remarkably accurate this was, as we and our belongings floated on a wall of water. All around were yells and shouts as tents were flattened. My bloody fags are down there, said a drenched mud red and Edgington, as he dove into the raging water. Waist deep, we ran among the flood, grabbing Kit and throwing it to the high ground. It ceased as suddenly as it had started. Why did it stop, said Edgington, Fifty minutes more, we could have been seen off fucking Portsmouth. 23rd of June, 1943. With the trees spaced along its length, the road to Satif curved hither and thither. We were at a thither part. Are those poplar trees, said Kidgel. Very, I said. We were bumping our way to the first rehearsal of the concert party. We had been, quote, talent spotted the night of the French Ensa do by Lance Bombardier Bennett. He had told Lance Bombardier Carter, you must hear these lads, which he did. Outside the municipal theatre, there are posters advertising Grand Concert. Two Agro Concert Party presents the Jolly Rogers in Stand Easy in aid of the Royal Artillery Benevolent Fund. It's 32 years since then, and so far, I haven't had a bloody penny. The stage was alive with scruffy gunners hanging up scenery. Tuning the piano with a pair of pliers is the musical director, Gunner Sabin. Edgington confronts him. Are you a trained piano tuner? No, said Sabin. That's why I'm in Africa. Ken Carter is on stage. Up here, he said, and led us backstage. These are your dressing rooms. We don't need them. We come ready dressed, I said. First night of the concert. Diary of Driver A Files, July 28, 43. First night, excited, but OK. We heard that the French Enser concert party had gone over a cliff on their way back to Algiers and they were now all in hospital. I prayed Mademoiselle Villon's boobs were all right. The opening night was attended by top brass and high-ranking local French officials whose sole purpose in life was neither to laugh nor to applaud anything. Backstage was alive with last-minute crises. Carter is hurrying in all directions, his hair falling out in handfuls. 
Lance Bombardier Reds Bennett is saying, fuck show business over and over again. We four are being made up. Blue eyeshadow, rude, lipstick. Kidja looks up. Give us a kiss, he said. I nearly did. It looks like a good program to Dejan. Not a spoon player in sight. Miles comes in. The theatre's packed. Well, for Christ's sake, unpack it, I said. We're due to start in ten minutes. A vast gunner in a vaster vest and shorts is calling down the corridors, Beginners, please! Beginners, please! And spitting out great pips. The pit band strikes up a tune which I recognise as the King, though I doubt if the Queen would. There follows a strange strangled version of the Royal Literary March Past that suggests gunners are cripples. The curtain rose, crashed down, and rose again. The whole cast appears singing, Kiss the Blues Goodbye. The show is away. Program of Concert When our turn came, I announced, Now, from the fabulous star-studded 56th Heavy Regiment, the 19-battery Jazz Quartet. We started by my putting my trumpet through the curtains, beginning on a low C, then ginging up to play softly as in the morning sunrise, very loudly. Then Kidgel sings Tangerine, and we feature Snatch on the violin and Stardust. We round off with Nagasaki. That's back in Nagasaki with the fellowship tobacco and the woman wiggy waggy woo. You can't describe a show. You have to be there at that time with that audience, and that's what made it come alive. Come alive it did. Troop audiences went into hysterics at the antics, and we got the sort of applause that would usually only be heard at a promenade concert. A penciled note at the foot of part two orders read, All ranks from now on will walk on their hands to keep their boots clean for parade. 2nd of July, 1943. After a week of success at Satif, the concert party were to go on tour. I can't believe it, said Edgington. I must rearrange my socks. It's true, I said. We're going to Bougie, to Jelly, Philipville, and who knows, maybe Broadway. And there, said Kidgel, they're all on the coast. We can swim every day. The Major calls me in and Pep talks me. Bombardier Milligan. You and 19 Battery Band hold the honour of the regiment when you are on that stage. I want you at all times to present a soldierly appearance, play in smart military manner, keep your bugle straight and slew to the finish. Try and play some stirring numbers like uh, Whistling Rufus. Remember, you're playing for your king and country. Yes, sir, I will, and if ever I play a wrong note, I'll immediately put myself on a charge. Good man, Milligan. Monday, 3rd of July, 43. Dead on 10 o'clock... Three lorries containing the concert party set off for Buji, some 60 kilometres away. We drove to the incredible Karata Gorge, onto the Gulf of Buji, on the coast road, heading west. It was scarifying. To our left were cliffs, but to our right a sheer 200-foot drop into the sea. I spotted dolphins pursuing a school of flying fish that kept breaking the surface and gliding up to 50 yards to escape. But the most exciting moment came when we were nearing Buji. A huge manta ray broke the surface and came down with a colossal splash. It repeated this several times. Uh, his old woman must be after him, said Snatchel. We passed a company of second fourth Hampshires marching like the clappers and covered in sweat. The only sympathy they got were the cries of, It'll be all over by Christmas, lads! We drove in white sunlight, a light breeze coming from the coast. Bougie was a French colonial town, now being used as a naval base. The show was at the Municipal Theatre. Modern horror architecture, but cool inside. We have access to magnificent bathing. A curving bay shut off from the world by low trees and bougainvilliers which ran down to the beach. As we did. But wait, wait. There on the beach are several wrens, all brown and beautiful in bathing costumes. Why, oh why, at the sight of a female... Does the male of the species automatically indulge in exhausting horseplay? Wrestling, running, jumping, sparring, hitting, leaping, acrobats, even attempted murders. I mean, by the time the wrens noticed us, we were too shagged out to do anything about it. Bennett was different. He started to dig about 30 yards away from the nearest wren. He was actually trying to tunnel and come up beside her. He might have, but for the great running feet, have gone a carpenter, who suddenly appeared to disappear into the ground, burying Gunner Bennett alive. In the theatre props room, we found a selection of plaster arms and legs, with which we swam, holding them above the waves at arm's length. Fifty yards from the shore was a rock shelf just below the surface, and to the lads I appeared to be walking on the water. There's only one other bloke ever done this, I said, and awaited a thunderbolt from heaven. 
Instead, Edgerton swims up and prepares one of his Captain Webb plunge dives. Arms above head, palms touching, he's waiting for the wrens to look this way. As they do, I whip his knickers down. He lets out a high female scream, Ah! and hands over his willy, falls into the water in the fetus position. That is fetus firstus. The wrens have had enough. They leave. We shout after them in mock rage. You dirty little devils! We know why you joined the Navy, says Kidgel. One day you'll come crawling back to us on your hands and knees. She's still be taller than you, short ass, said Harry. Ken Carter is lying half in, half out of the Mediterranean, the waves lapping up his shorts. It's lovely, he coos. And from where I'm standing, it looks bloody horrible, says Kidgel. There's a loud yell from Edgerton, who comes galloping from the sea. I've been stung, he's shouting, and points to a red mark on his arm. Oh, it suits you, I said. It must have been the only jellyfish in a thousand miles, but Edgerton finds it. This was not the finish. In minutes three, it stung him again. Surely a world's record. He got a stick and went thrashing at the sea in foaming rage. I'll oh, give it bloody jellyfish, he was shouting, when it stung him from behind for the third time. We rehearsed the show in the cool of the evening, but Ken Carter was a stickler for perfection, so that it was really midnight before we finished. We were all dog-tired and barked ourselves to sleep. We were billeted in a huge concrete school on three floors, occupying what was a classroom with a running balcony overlooking the sea. At night, the sea breezes afforded us a cool night's sleep. That was all we could afford. Sunday, 4th of July. Like all Catholics, I ask God's forgiveness for missing Mass. Duggan, a devout Roman Catholic in front of me, did you miss Mass? Not really, I said. You know, it is the mortal sin. Yes, but I, I don't feel any different. I mean, if they're going to make sins in the graves, then God should have made feelings to go with them. That is, say, if I commit a mortal sin, I should get a pain in the leg or something. Otherwise, it doesn't have any effect. Don't worry, though. I'll do what all good laps Catholics do. Relent on my deathbed. How do you know, continued Duggan, putting his prayer book back in his big pack, that this is not your deathbed you are laying on right now? I don't know. In any case, it's not mine. It's Kidgel's. He'd be very angry if I die on it. He's a Protestant. We spent the day on the beach, much the same as yesterday. We got very badly sunburnt. Kidgel's nose looked like a piece of shredded wheat. Children screamed when they saw him. Oh, that sounds hot, he said. Well, you shouldn't touch it, I said. Eddington had found an old French brass baritone saxophone. He became obsessed with the idea that it was a sign from God and that he was about to become a second Harry Carney. That's a famous baritone player from the Duke Ellington's band. He took the instrument down to the beach and played it waist-deep in water. He seemed quite happy. After making a series of noises on it, he announced, I've just played I've Got a Girl in Kalamazoo. You sure she's not in Whipslade, said a surfacing head. I don't think you're going to become a second Harry Carney, mate, I said. A fifteenth or sixteenth, maybe, but a second. When not in use, Edgington used most of the instrument as a close horse and the bell as an ashtray or a spittoon. We rehearsed in the evening and we now had Gunnar Dugan on double bass. This gave the band a wonderful lift. He played a rock-steady two in a bar while reminding me I was a Catholic. After rehearsal, we took ourselves to an Arab cafe for dinner and ordered eggs and chips. We stood on our balcony. It was midnight, and the moonlit Mediterranean appeared like burnished black steel. From out to sea came the sound of heavy naval gunfire. That sounds like a, a naval engagement, said Harry. Well, I hope they're both very happy, I said. Edgerton then blew a few smoke rings that remained suspended in the still air. Slowly he passed his finger through one and bisected it. Then we all went to bed for a night of traditional sleeping. Navy dance at Bougie. 6th of July, 1943. The Navy are holding a dance tomorrow and they want you to play, said Button. How much, said my Jewish side. A sweet F.A., but all the booze you want. OK. Another thing, Admiral Cunningham's coming. The do was in the huge school dining room. The Navy, with flair for such occasions, put up coloured bunting. We finished our show by nine o'clock and the dance started at ten. The top of the piano was lined with whiskey and gin. Uh, that's for you, said a snotty. I told you we should have joined the bloody Navy, said Kidgel. By 10.30 the hall was packed with dancers. The heat of the African night was unforgettable. It was like a giant sauna bath. We were getting through the grog. By 11.30 our KDs were black with sweat. 
Still we drove the jazz along. Edgenan went into a trance. What care you in, I said. Be flat. I'd better come up half a tone and join you then, I said. We'd start a number, but he'd have to wait a few bars to realise what it was. Go on, he'd say. I'll catch up with you. The wrens looked unbearably attractive in their white uniforms with their tanned limbs. Oh, the heat, the heat, the limbs, the limbs. By one thirty, I was stoned and making announcements like, We're out of fag, says Kidgel. OK, I say. I approached Admiral Cunningham, who, despite the three-four tempo, was dancing in five-four. Excuse me, sir, I said. It's not an excuse me, sir, he replied. Uh, excuse me, sailor, then. I wonder if you've got any fags. He was about to have me flogged, but realising I was the life and soul of the party, produced a packet of ship's woodbines. Someone had turned the lights out to cool the place. Shafts of moonlight lit up the interior. By two o'clock, several wrens had been molested. Several men had been molested. All the booze had been drunk. Red, whiskey-filled faces staggered past. Some with partners. Sailors were dancing together. Oh, yes. At 0230 hours, I'd had enough, because there was no more. Leaving Harry, Doug and Al still playing, I pushed through the sweating bodies up the stairs, along the stone veranda to the classroom where we slept. I'd lost my mozzinet, so I emptied my palliasse and got inside. Later. Thud! Groan. It had to be someone with a big head hitting a stone floor. Harry! Of course, it was time for his accident. I got up, forgetting I was in a mattress, and crashed to the floor. I pushed my feet through the bottom and made for what was a huge, drunken, semi-conscious, groaning figure. Sergeant Holland and Kidgel appeared, both naked. We stood round the slumped creature. It's Harry, said Kidgel, and he shit himself. We dragged him by his lovely legs towards the shower at the end of the corridor. Oh, oh, said the draggy. Standing him on his head, we slid the body from the trousers and reversed same for his shirt. We propped the dead, shit-covered body under the shower and turned it on. He slept there all night. About 4.30 in the morning, I heard a groaning thing approaching. Let me in, it said. There's no door, I told him. It walked in, fell onto the bed, which splintered. We heard the head go thud for the second time, and he slept like an angel with a baby smile on his fizz. There had been a time, when he was but three, his mother tucked him in and gave him a bottle. He'd come a long way since then. The morning after. My God, my head. Edgington said, file said. Kittle awoke me. Who am I? I said. Uh, there's an inspection at 8.30 hours by Captain Lehman. We had to stand by our beds. Edgington got as far as putting his vest on. Then exhausted, he just sat on the bed. Captain Lehman said, What is it? It's uh, one of ours, sir, I said. Why is it green? It's uh, something to do with the abnormal fluid intake, sir, I said. He stopped at Kidgel, unshaven, two unseeing red eyes staring over the blanket top. Does his mother know, said the officer? Yes, sir. It's Pozolican, sir. Spazolicans? Yes, sir. Only he, being short, has got them low down. This was all done very straight-faced. Captain Lehman said, Very good, Bombardier. Carry on, and left the room. I heard him burst into convulsive laughter outside. Alf Files Diary Wednesday the 7th of July, 1943. Sorry to leave Bougie. 60 miles to Dijeli. Rehearsed in Glacier Cinema, where we gave show. Few civilians here. After short rehearsal, we take a truck with band and posters to advertise the show. Funniest thing ever. Afternoon show fair. Evening a wow. Standing room only. Crazy gang, ad-lib bits, hilarious. We packed up and set off to Dijeli, 60 miles from Bougie. We drove along the spectacular Gulf of Bougie Road, which hugged the coast. The scenery made mincemeat of tourist Valhallas like Nice, Costa Blanca and Blackpool. We were billeted in rooms at the back of the stage. The matinee was not too well booked, but the evening shows were all sellout, and of course the show was forever improving. More and more gags being fed into it. It was tending to become a hells of poppin'. In the show, Sergeant Holland sang Jerusalem, and during this we took up positions behind the curtain, all joining in harmony. Just for fun, Ernie Evans pulled the curtain to reveal the holy chorus, standing in underpants towels with some holding beer mugs. If that's the promised land, I don't want to know, said Carter. I've just heard the invasion of Sicily started at three this morning, said Alf Files in the interval. 
At the end of the show, we announced the news. The audience cheered. At last, things were going our way. Friday, 9th of July, 1943. Files Diary. Success again. Crazy gang looking half nuts in insane selection of dressing up gear. Spike on Harry's shoulders, trombone case on head. Edgerton is six foot three, so with me on its shoulders, it made it ten foot six. And a trombone case on my head made us fifteen foot high. I'm draped from the waist downwards in a huge curtain that obscures Edgington. Underneath is Kidgel holding a pole with the boxing glove on, which shoots out and hits the bloke in front, who is walking backwards, spitting out pretend teeth. My diary, Sunday the 11th of July. End of tour. Packing up to return to unit. We set off in a glorious sunny morning, loaded with local wines, cheeses and fruits. Sprawled on top of the scenery truck is Edgington, his giant saxophone wrapped in the tricolour. Is it dead, I said. Driver Kittel realises it's twenty minutes since breakfast. So, got any dates, he asks hopefully. Yes, I have some dates. January the 3rd and March the 7th. Back at Ainabessa, mail was waiting. What's this? Income tax demand, 1938-39? Sir, it has been brought to our notice that in the year 1938-39 you received payments of money as a professional musician. See subsection D... 3 para 9, section 76. Will you please remit immediately a list of payments received, dates, and by whom the payment was made? I sent the following reply. Date, 1st of January. Place, Scrabble Rupture Appliance Limited, Annual Hernia Dance. Band leader, Tom Danger. 1st June, Sweet Sue, two choruses, uh, 10 shillings and a penny halfpenny. 2nd June, Little Dutch Time Bomb, Tick Tock Boom, 14 shillings and threepence. Date, engagement, May 6th, 39. Dagenham District Ramblers Club. Band leader, Eric Knotts. Tunes, Honeysuckle Rose, 3 and 6. August 23rd, 39. Place, Leeds Cat Crematorium Social. Band leader, Sir Henry Wood. Tune, God Save the King. Payment, gratis. June the 6th, 40. Place, Dunkirk. Band leader, General Alexander. Tune, The Retreat, gratis. Total one pound seven shillings and ten pence halfpenny. July 1943. The heat, 115 degrees. The African sky, lost in the reflected glare of the sun, appears like a distant white mist. It is empty save for one lone kite circling high. Work has stopped for the day, and I am on my bed re-reading old newspapers. There is a picture of the Queen inspecting runner beans on a bomb site allotment in Bethnal Green. Another of Dorothy Paget watching a horse straight deal training for the derby. A hundred-year-old villager in Tadworth ringing the bell for victory in Tunisia. Would it not be more newsworthy if we saw the Queen on straight deal, eating the runner beans, while Dorothy Paget pulls the one hundred-year-old villager's Tadworth as he rings the bell for the start of the derby, or the old man training one hundred-year-old runner beans to climb up Dorothy Paget's legs as the Queen pulls a rope attached to straight deal as it trains for the victory in Tunis, or the Queen pulling runner beans as one hundred-year-old Dorothy Paget inspects an old village's victory bell for the derby winner's legs. A tent is speaking. I have a feeling we should be home by Christmas. Christmas? I recall my last one in England in 1942. An O.P. on the coast of Bexhill. It was very cold. I peered into the black of the English Channel. The bastards! They're only twenty miles away. Possibly, at this moment, Hitler was chasing Evelbron with a sprig of holly. Come, mein darling, let us do it under the mistletoe. It is Christmas. I'll be Pink Crosby dreaming on a white mistress. The telephone buzzed. OP, I answered. There was stifled laughter from the other end, then a voice disguised as erupted in Tony and said, Hello, who is that? It's Gunnar Milligan, sir. Who is that, sir? It's Lieutenant Shagdog. A burst of hysterical laughter then, click. It rang again. If that's Lieutenant Shagdog, I said, he can piss off. It wasn't Lieutenant Shagdog. <laughs> this was Captain Martin. Have you been drinking, Milligan? He said, at which moment there was a terrific explosion from the minefield to my right. What was that man? I don't know, sir. Go and see what it was. How do you go and look for a bang that's finished? I ran down the hill. The grass in the minefield is on fire. A priest constable on a bike said, Hello, what's this then? I pointed. I think a mine went off. He shone his torch. A butcher's van arrived, pulling a fire appliance, the Bexhill ARP Fire Brigade. A lot of little old men in pyjamas fell off it and started pulling a hose towards the fire. 
Put it out, hurry, before the bloody Germans see it. Just in time, we stopped them all walking into the minefield. We'll have to use high pressure, said one who was doing nothing and was therefore in charge. Where's the nearest fire hydrant? The policeman thought and said, it's sea road, a mile away. Hoses won't reach that far. Ah, he held one finger in the air. Get the suction in and the sea lads. Two little men threw their hoses over the cliff. The tide's out, said the leader. We must hurry before the fire goes out. It started to rain and the fire fizzled out. I returned to the OP to the sound of a midget voice playing at high speed. My God, Captain Martin, I forgot about him. I grabbed the phone. Where the hell have you been? I've missed six rounds. Did you mean boxing or drink, sir? I explained the story to him. You must be more careful in future, was his final command. Peace settle on the land. Is anyone in this sentry box? It was an old lady. But what is it, madam? This is a military area. Civilians aren't allowed here. I am a military, she said. The WVS Reserve. Are those men on the cliff looking for my dog? No. A dog? A dog, of course. Do you live near the minefield, madam, I said. Right behind it. When the Germans come, we'll have a lovely view of them going up. I've put Grand's chair near the window. The news could have been broken to her less painfully. Next morning, a policeman arrived, unwrapped a piece of newspaper revealing a tail, a leg and a collar. Is this your dog, madam? he said. Tuesday, the 10th of August, 1943. My diary. Since the concert party terminated, there had been unending demands for all regiments for its return. So lucky, 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 we started re-rehearsing. We are to do two more shows, and after that, finish. It's much the same as the old show, except for a few changes. Beryl Southby, a girlfriend in Norwood, sent me a tune, Happy Go Lucky, which we use for the finale. Friday, the 13th, August, 1943. Alf Files Diary. Show a wow. During this time, all the battery were away on a calibration shoot out to sea near Ziyama Rest Camp. From Aina Bessa, we could see the gun flashes at night. Feels as if the war is coming back again, and I don't like it. Saturday, the 14th of August, my diary. Last night of show. Party on stage afterwards. There was a send-up with everyone doing everyone else's act. It went on until 2 a.m. and the wine flowed like water. Towards the end of the evening, it tasted like it. Sunday. 15th of August, 1943. I don't believe it. The whole band are on guard, with me as guard commander. What a shambles we looked on parade. Edgington, six foot three. Next to him, Doug Kidgel, five foot six. Edgington had forgotten his gaiters and forgotten to do up his bootlaces. The battery returned during the guard mounting, and the cat calls were too much to bear. Got you at last, have they? Ha ha ha! On August the 18th, our life of semi-torpor and lotus heating came to an abrupt end. Suddenly, we were overwhelmed by a training program that seemed intent on destroying us before the Germans did. It started with 20-mile route marches in full FSMO, through raging torrents, down thorn-covered ravines and up cactus-covered cliffs. I left camp every morning a youth of 23 and came back at night looking like a 70-year-old char lady. Even when you threw yourself on your bed, your legs went on marching. When the war's over... I'm never going to stand up again, said Kidgel. The programme reached its climax with a week on the artillery ranges at Chateau Dun, in the most godforsaken, inhospitable countryside I've ever seen. The ground was covered with large, hard rocks, so uneven, one sprayed an ankle a day, and I only had two. We were issued with new number 19 and number 22 wireless sets, which had to be carried on our backs. I watched as Major Jenkins led Edgington and Bombardier True up a 60-degree slope of crumbling rocks. Edging and humping two batteries weighing a hundred pounds and true with a wireless on his back. In the broiling sun, I don't know how they did it. I was link man between the OP and the gun, both half a mile away. I had to spend 48 hours on my own in utter loneliness without sight or sound of human habitation. At night, I was terrified by strange sniffing sounds and for protection did that childlike thing put my head under the blanket. Finally, on September the 4th, it was all over. The regiment left, leaving behind a small party of cleaner-uppers, of which I was put in charge. We had to collect all the rubbish and bury it, and we took our time. By the evening, we'd finished and drove back. It was a warm, dark night, the air caressing the palm trees, a pier as velvet cutouts. The meadows of heaven are chorusing stars. The glow of edging and cigarette bounced in the dark corner of the lorry. No one spoke, which was rare for us. We really were shagged out. It's 2100 hours. The lorry gradually slowed to a halt. 
Ain't a besser, centre of the universe, said driver shipman. All change. Did he mean underwear? Edgelin jumped from the tail ward like a lad of twenty and hit the ground like a man of ninety. That night we slept like dead men. Even a thunderstorm in the night didn't wake us. September the 5th, 1943. Battery diary. All light vehicles left for Philipville, staging at Ain Millia. That means we lost files. We said goodbye, see you somewhere sometime. He gave us a thumbs up and a smile as he drove off with the convoy. It was all happening. We were given no rest. Intensive signal training. We had to learn new signaling codes. We had to adopt the American phonetics. A used to be Ack, now it was Abel. B used to be Beer, now it was Baker, and so on. We were told to replace all our old kit, and for most of us that meant everything. Our caddies were so threadbare, the Arabs refused to steal them. My underwear on a line looked like distress signals from a shipwrecked tramp. 8th September, 1943. Italy have surrendered, mamma mia! 9th September, 1943. 5th Army lands at Salerno. There's heavy fighting. 8th Army lands in the south unopposed. The days that followed were all focused on the wireless news about Salerno. It was obvious that it was pretty tricky going, with the 8th Army hurrying up the coast to link up with the 5th. On the 13th September, Alexander signalled Churchill, I consider situation critical. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, no. I had to buy Alexander's biography in 1973 to find that out, but then it was too late for me to worry. It was a near thing. All our vehicles are being waterproof. Looks like a beach landing. Oh, yes, waterproof the bloody vehicles. What about us, said Gunner White. Doesn't matter if we drown. 10th September, 1943. Loading party returns from Philipville, where they have been loading vehicles onto cargo ships. We're all puzzled. If we were waterproofing vehicles, why are they on cargo ships? Somewhere, Harry, I said, there is a lunatic. Every day, he's taken from Coney Hatch, locked in a room with a phone at the war office. He phones through a series of orders, and they are transmitted directly to us. Edgington nodded his head and laughed. It's, yes, it's something like that, he said. Now, dear reader, a blank appears in my memory. All there is in my diary is the word pissed. This happened between September the 10th and the 11th. But I recall arriving back in the lorry with Edging into Ainabessa to discover the camp deserted. They've deserted without us, said Edgington, jumping down. Wait, an oil lamp glows in yon Nissen hut, I said. A figure filled the doorway. It was Bombardier Fuller. Where's everybody, I said. Ah, they've gone to a secret destination, 397, said Fuller, donning his crash helmet. He gave us 15 minutes to pack any gear we had left in the Nissen hut. We were all a bit dazed by the change of events. Here we were looking forward to a good night's sleep, and now we were off to somewhere. This is an outrage, said Edgerton, as he strained, lifted, and hurled his kit into the lorry. It's also an inrage, I said, carefully mixing my kit with his. We've got to catch up with the main convoy, said Fuller. They're ten hours ahead. Australia's only eight, I said. Well, let's chase that instead. It's nearer, said Edgerton. Hurry up, shouts Fuller. We're keeping Adolf waiting. Fuck him, said a voice under some strain. Right away! Edgerton slams the tailboard and bangs on the side. Off we drive in exactly the same direction from which we had come. With a roll blanket for a pillow, I fell into a deep sleep. I awoke with a start. We appeared to be driving over a field of corrugated iron. The vibration moved us about like chess pieces. Edgington, still asleep, passed me on his way to the tailboard. The quality of the vibrations changed, and Edgington passed me again. To the back of the lorry, I saw a late moon. It bounced like a ping-pong ball as the lorry jolted. Edgington was going towards the tailboard again. He was awake. What's the time, he yawned. I held up my wristwatch, waiting for a shaft of moonlight. Well? He insisted. What's the time? I'm waiting for the moon, I said. Oh, he said. You can tell the time by the moon? Yes, I said. It's exactly 0400. What is, he said, the moon? We slept fitfully on. At intervals we heard trucks going the other way. While we slept, the Anglo-American Fifth Army were locked in a grim, slaughtering battle. It was touch and go, with Kesselring throwing everything in to hurl the Allies back into the sea. If he did, it would be a devastating blow, especially for Churchill, who had conceived the idea of attacking the soft underbelly of Europe, though the troops in the beachhead would be saying, Soft underbelly, my ass." September the 11th and 12th, 1943, my diary. Caught up with main convoy at 0500 hours, just outside Ain Millia. Breakfast amid olive groves. 
Bought delicious green grapes in village. Convoy's waiting for a lost truck to turn up. By midday, no sign of it, so we all push on again. I spent the whole day asleep in the back of the truck, only waking for food. By nightfall, we arrived at Gardimo. It was so dark, I had no idea what the place looked like. I went on sleeping as fast as I could so we could get there quicker. I slept all night and only awoke when Gunnar Edgington said, Here, Rip Van, what's it? and gave me a cup of tea. We walked to the wireless truck for the seven o'clock news about Salerno. The announcer was saying, Three attacks by panzers were thrown back in the night. It all sounds dodgy. A huge formation of Baltimore bombers passed overhead in the direction of Sicily. That ought to cheer the lads up, said Ben Wenham. Then American, they're likely to drop the bloody lot on us, said White. Drivers are warming up their engines. They are dispersed among the olive trees, affording ideal camouflage for the vehicles which are painted black and green. Prepare to move! The order rings through the camp. Diesel fumes turn the air blue. Gradually the convoy pulls onto the road. The leader raises his hand, drops it, and we pull away. This was a slow convoy, pulling heavy guns. The speed averaged 30 miles an hour. We had crossed the border into Tunisia, and we were passing familiar battlegrounds where the skeletons of German tanks lay rusting. In the fields, amid grazing sheep, Arabs are reworking the land, plying around the shell holes. We passed acres of cork trees and groves of eucalyptus trees. It all seemed so peaceful. Yet here we were, obviously headed for Salerno, and bloody hell! We passed Sidi Nasser, where the gallant 155 battery had made their stand against General Lang's 10th Panzer and Mark VI tanks of 501 Heavy Tank Battalion 17. The guns were fought to the muzzle. Only nine gunners survived, but they put pay to the German advance. September the 13th, 1943. We have travelled 500 miles in three days. Or is it three miles in 500 days? Whatever, it was bloody rough and dusty. The endless jolting and bumping, numbing one's mind and body alike. Everywhere now are massive American camps and dumps. Mile after mile of shells and supplies, tanks and vehicles. Battalions and marching infantry are everywhere. Our destination was a mile outside Berserta, near the great Salt Lac de Berserta. A vast camp called Houston and Texas. There seemed to be absolutely no organisation, so we presumed it was ours. The country was a mixture of the flat and the hilly, covered in brown tussock grass, all flattened by thousands of vehicle tracks. We put up our bivvies anywhere and waited. Uh, what's on then? inquires Chalky White. I'm doing military waiting, I said. Military waiting, he said. Yes, definitely military waiting. What for? Uh, that is something I don't know, I said. All I know is that I'm waiting in military, and by your appearance you are also waiting in military. You know, to think I've been walking around here for an hour, and I didn't know what I was doing, and all the time I was doing military waiting. Edgerton, Devine and Toome are approaching with military waiting. Got any fags, was the query. I distributed a packet of passing clouds my parents had sent me. I had up till now refrained from using them, as they had been packed in a parcel with bars of soap. Smoking them was exactly like chewing a bar of Life Boy. However, they smoked them in complete agony. But such is the power of nicotine, Edgerton bought the whole packet off me. Thereafter, it was easy to tell when he'd been smoking one, as he went grey and his spit turned to bubbles. We found a huge naffy and a marquee. There was a brand new upright piano, so we gave the lads a session of jazz until a spoon player appeared. September the 14th. Thank God. Paper aid. What's this? It's in Lira. So it is Italy for sure. We are given a small booklet. Customs and language of Italy. It says here the Italians are very jealous of their women and in the south they are usually chaperoned. Oh? What's chaperoned? That means they've always got someone with them. Oh? What happens if you want to have it away with her? Well... The chaperone has to be done as well, otherwise they won't let you do it at all. The daily routine, morning parade with small arms, maintenance and training, lunch, afternoon off. The afternoon was spent doing laundry and writing letters in the naffy. Usually a lorry went down to the great surf beach at Cap Blanc, just outside Berserta, which was crowded with American troops. The sea here has huge breakers, and great fun was had diving into them or coming in surfboard style. From the 15th to the 20th, we passed the time as best as we could, and it wasn't good enough. 
Apparently, we were waiting for landing craft from Salerno. They had stayed longer than anticipated, as at one stage it seemed as though they would have to evacuate the beachhead. We played football games that went on for hours, with sides of up to 50. Scores like 63 goals to 98 were not uncommon. Our MO described the camp as the only lunatic asylum run by the inmates. I wrote home to my brother. Dear Harry, don't ask me what is happening. It's whispered that the war is over, and no one has the nerve to tell us. The American troops don't know what we are. They drive past us in Cadillacs, throw us sweets, and ask where our sisters are. We play 500 side football. It's the only way one can get a game. The Nafi queue is nine miles long. The men at the front are from World War I. Our major wants us to invade Italy so we can see Vesuvius before it goes out. He is a brilliant soldier and can almost dress himself. It's a very trying time. Try it. Love to Mum and Dad, your ever-loving brother, known as 954024. September the 21st, 1943. This evening, we collected the camp rubbish and lit a bonfire. We gathered around and sang to the tune of Alouetta, Balls to Jumbo, Balls to Jumbo Jenkin, Balls to Jumbo, Balls to Jumbo Jenks. Amongst those singing loudest is Captain Bentley, the regimental chaplain. We sat and watched as the embers finally died. Then we retired to our tents. I lit my little oil lamp and read The Persians by Aeschylus. I'd never been a scholar as such, but I had a voracious appetite for knowledge, and I wished to know what the golden age of Greece was like and to learn about its inheritors, the Romans. So my father sent me many books on the subject, though my choice baffled him, for he was reading Wild Bill Hickok, Buffalo Bill, and Deadwood Dick, and I think he still is. 22nd of September, 1943. Battery Diary. First party embarked, part of HQ 17 and 19 batteries. In terms of the physical, it started when a crowd of our officers started to run at high speed in all directions, crashing into one another and finally disappearing into the HQ tent, whose sides bulged outward with the combustion of commissioned ranks within. Suddenly, the tent flaps burst open and out thunders the officers. Lieutenant Pride says, We're off, lads. As usual, it should have been done yesterday. A great scramble ensues, and by ten o'clock we are on our way to whatever it is we are on our way to which turns out to be Berserker docks. Some hundred LST, landing ships' tanks, are lined up, jaws open, waiting to devour us. Through the stifling day, in that peculiar muddled British style, we load our vehicles onto the HMS Boxer. We watch her sink lower and lower in the water, as hour after hour we pile our gear aboard. There's no bunks, uh, chaps. Sleep wherever you can, said Lefton and Pride. We are issued with seasick pills. I never suffer from them, so I threw them over the side where the fish ate them and were immediately sick. It's all very exciting, said Kidgel. Wonder what they're going to do with us. But well, first, they're going to make us seasick, and when we are vomiting at our limit, land us on a beach in Italy under shell fire. The ramp is being winched up. Hello, we're off then. The engines throb into harder stern. We hear the ring of the ship's telegraph. We pull away from the jetty. We are all lining the railings. It's six o'clock as we pull into the middle of the Lac de Berserta. Well, said Kidgel, rubbing his hands with excitement, we're off at last, whereupon we drop an anchor. You were saying, I said, there's a cool breeze from the sea. Grab up! We all troop down to the galley where containers of hot stew are opened and doled out along with a mug of ship's cocoa. Like a fag, a sailor, short and squat, holds out a fifty tin of ship's woodbines. In those days a luxury. Tar, I said, with a certain amount of surprise. Take Amphil, he said. This is a trap, I thought. You're not queer, are you, I said. His name was Eddie Hackshaw. As darkness fell, there was a feeling of frustration on board. So I got up me bugle, and down on the mess deck blew some tunes. Eddie Hackshaw was so pleased he gave me a silver Arab ring. It'll bring you good luck, he forecast. Good luck, I said. What's that? He wangled an extra mug of cocoa for me before we all settled down for the night. Doug Kidgel and I stepped on top of his scammel. It was incredibly quiet. We could hear the lap of the waves against the ship. As I lay, stretched out on top of the huge scammel lorry, believing I would surely die at Salerno, I started to cogitate on my will. The last one I made out was when I was due to get killed in the North African landings. However, we had arrived too late. My most expensive possession was my trumpet. I wanted that buried with me in case I'm buried alive. 
I could blow a few bars and they would dig me up again. Second most expensive item, twenty wills woodbines in an old tobacco tin. Then there were the women. Listen to this, Kidgel. I want you to be witness. It's my last will and testament. You're making it out on top of a lorry, he said in disgust. Do you know a better place? Listen. My women. I'll leave Ivy Chandler and three woodbines to Gunner Chalky White. I'll leave Kay of Hurstmanso to Gunner Devine. I'll leave Betty Orsman and one woodbine to Gunner Kidgel. Is that the one with the big boobs, he said. Yes, smashing, but only one woodbine. That's all you'll have time for with her. Now to Gunner Plunger Bailey. I leave Shirley Wright, Mrs. Leach and Molly Parkinson. Oh, that's not enough for him. It'll have to do. This is an emergency. Now, to my mother, I leave my brother, and to my father, I leave my mother. What are you going to leave your brother? I'm going to leave him alone. Those were the last thoughts as I dropped into a sleep that would terminate in volume four. What time will Bombardier Milligan arise? What will be his first word to the dawn? Read all about it in volume four. Order your copy today. I need a reason to start writing it. I wonder why we're waiting, I said to Kitchell as I threw my stub end over the side. Uh, we're waiting for the tide, said Kitchell. That's the best news I've had. Why, the meds tied us. Ha <laughs> ha! was Monty, His Part in My Victory, written and read by Spike Milligan.